up, has up, has up, has a kind of mystery. Has up, has up, has a kind of mystery. From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Podcast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. All right. So it's raining out. Yeah. A little bit. We've just not gotten enough rain all summer, though. It's been very dry. Um, uh, Very dry, but like... Desperately humid. Yeah, humid, <laughs> humid in the air and dry on the on ground. The ground. Yeah. And, and we keep having these brief storms that blow right. through. Like even the storm that took out our power. It was like 10 minutes long. It didn't. Uh, there was like a tenth of an inch of rain, you know, yeah, even it though very, it knocked down all the trees. So it was all this rain all at once. It was yeah. kind of intense. Yeah. It, you know, if it had gone at that intensity for like, I don't know, half the day, that could have been really good. It's so dry that I... Um, have seen things here that I've never seen in Ann Arbor. Driving out mm-hmm. to my office, actually on the way back from lunch on Jackson Road, uh, some workers, some road workers, were standing around on the median frantically trying to put out a grass fire because they had someone had managed to ignite, like, I don't know, a 50 yard strip of the median along Jackson Road, and it right. was like a, a miniature forest fire, you like, know, what? on grass. Yeah. But on grass. Yeah, and then when I got back to my office and sat down at my desk, a few minutes later I heard fire truck <laughs> heading for it. But, you know, yeah. I, I get frustrated because <clears throat> I keep tweeting at MLive and whatnot, asking them about stuff, and a lot of the stuff that happens, like, actually very locally... Right. I never get an explanation for it. It never shows up in any it local news, even yeah. like the live stream, because right. they're so disconnected no from locally. Yeah, they're so disconnected from actual, you know, on the ground stuff. You would think they would use Twitter then, right? You would think. They and they've never responded to me. Twitter doesn't function that way apparently anymore. Yeah. So. So here we are. So here we are. Um, my. Th- throat and chest are actually a bit raw and it's it sounds crazy to say but it's happened before when there are wildfires out west right they i are here uh, i feel it here right. slightly it's well, not i've enough. seen and like the the nut job press yeah it's just you know i always feel like they're the hot <coughs> shits you know men in black <laughs> yes. you know, if you want to know what's really going on yeah. check out the nut job press yes so they're like wildfire smoke is 3,000 miles away in New York City. I'm like, seems legit. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I I am convinced that I I experience it, uh, you know, mild right. symptoms, but I have to use my inhaler mm-hmm. uh, and my, you know, chest is burning. And it can't be good for the kids. Meanwhile, yeah. people out there are in Des- dire straits. bad air you know the, really these, these tiny soot change. particles that can do damage and it's gonna it's gonna shorten their lives and make them hospitalized for breathing problems on a clear day a clear you day. know 10 years from now or five years from now people who yeah. are already sick and marginal are just really gonna suffer from this yeah it's horrifying but i you know i'm i have notes for shows and shows about Climate change, I feel kind of helpless and stymied to, like, get the message out because I never get any traction, you know. Oh, well, you you know, I've, we've talked before, I don't think we've done a show on climate change, but you and I have talked before about climate change, and I think the traction problem is by design. Yeah, of course. Right. And I don't think it's about, and I actually don't think it's the denialists themselves. Yeah. I think there are tools in the design of not getting the... Right, the word out, but I don't think it's the denialist per se. Um, I think it's our unwillingness to really have a heartfelt public conversation. Yeah, about what we're going to do. Right. No, absolutely. So you know, another show, another show waiting to happen. Yeah. Um. So I want to do a couple quick topics. Yeah. Um. 
We bought a book called Dragons at Crumbling Castle and Other Tales. <laughs> so we bought a book? That's not news. That's not news. Okay. This book, this particular book is news. Oh, it's news. We don't have that one yet. Okay. This is a book of short stories by Terry Pratchett. And, uh, you know, Terry Pratchett wrote all the Discworld novels. Uh, he recent, recently died and uh, had a high-profile death as he... Well, okay, recently. Like like less than 50 years. Less than 50 years. <laughs> he, he had a high-profile death because he had early-onset Alzheimer's, and he wasn't yeah. really that old. He really was not. Um, but um, he, yeah, he died of Alzheimer's, and it was uh, he was an advocate for assisted suicide and things like that. Although, uh, from what I hear, he didn't actually wind up Killing taking himself. that option. I don't, I don't know. Anyway. He he was a beloved author. I really enjoy some of his work. And what we have in this collection are stories that he actually published in a small town newspaper yeah. when he was a teenager. Yes. So he'd been writing a long time. He'd been writing a long time. Yeah. And uh, so I quick review. Um, it's fun. It does read like some work written by an energetic and imaginative young and inexperienced writer. Right. You know, so uh, it's very funny at the sentence level. Uh, he didn't really structure the stories so that they build up to strong plot points. Mm-hmm. Right. It, I think, you know, he probably just wrote it as he went, you know, and there are a lot of funny puns and funny bits of dialogue and funny gags and funny references. It's funny at the scene level, but it doesn't build up jokes that take like pages to land, right? Oh, right. It doesn't really, they don't really build up a story arc that take pages to get there and then really are satisfying in that mm-hmm. way. No. Not, it kind of goes, where, at least the one we read, it kind of goes yeah. where you thought it was going to go. Yeah. Yeah. And a silly ending. Right. So the the style of humor is more on the silly side. Um, the kids enjoyed it, but I will comment and say that um, when I gave them the option the other night of reading more stories out of this book or reading Orwell. Like unanimously went one of the warm up. <laughs> they voted for Down and Out in Paris and London instead of these Pratchett stories, which I think is funny because you're always telling me you've got to read the kids more children's stuff. Well, I'm talking about the, the JV team. The younger kids. The younger kids, yeah. yeah. The older kids have a, a more nuanced yeah. reading palette and, yeah. and are ready to, especially things like oral with all this body language and right. naughty scenes and things that they you know, aren't supposed to know about. Well, that's yeah. that's what they find fascinating, I think, about Orwell is that like it's a glimpse into a dark adult world you yes. know, of poverty. Right. right, right. So that's fascinating. And yeah. in a way that Oliver Twist just is not engaging them, right? Oliver Twist, the, there's a real language barrier. Right. And, yeah. But like the three younger kids, even Eleanor will engage with a story that's appropriate for her age level. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, so 18 months old has no problem engaging in story time for, you know, a while. Mm-hmm. But it, you know, Orwell's not going to do it for her. Yeah, or Benjamin, and to some extent Pippin. Yeah. Whereas the the you know, but Pippin have, voted for Orwell. Like yeah, he did. Well, no, they all love the the body, uh, dark adult world. They also like it when I attempt to do accents the, and characters. All the Russian accents and the French accents and the characters. Yeah, they really enjoy that too. Yeah. But but yeah, no, I, I think a lot of the stories we are, we're trying to read, even for Pippin at seven, mm-hmm. it, it's. It's a stretch for him to stay yeah. engaged. Yeah, stay engaged, and um, they could engage with one of the many hundreds of very good children's stories that we have. Well, we okay. We need to get more into a routine where we actually have enough time to read a JV story and then a varsity story. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but we are usually. So it took so long time. to get through the cleanup chores, and we had to argue and debate, you know, for so long right. that there's no time left for all this. Time left. Oh, oh yeah. well. So, so yeah, it's hard. But I, it's, it's. I think it's the JV kids who miss out. Yeah. Right. Who just 
develop a, an antagonism to story time when they just they're just supposed to sit sit still while we talk to each other. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. and I don't think that's entirely fair. All right. Well, I have been reading Benjamin like um, Curious George stories and oh Baron yeah, Stain Bear stories. Like when he's, he he he'll select a story and bring it. Yeah. yeah. If he does that, and we have time, I'll read that to him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And now for something very different. Oh. Um, I have not written this is from my blog i've not written uh in a long time about a lot of music that i listen to oh yeah 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 uh in part because i haven't really been listening to anything new recently but um i have uh i've had this cd of music from the opera nixon in china a few years ago i bought a bundle of cds of used classical cds from a a used record shop in saginaw Mm mm-hmm and it was it's quite a bundle there was 75 discs in there yeah. roughly uh one or two were unplayable because of age but right. most of them are fine most of them were just fine yeah yeah and um so i've been listening to this finally i had listened to it briefly before but not really gotten into it mm-hmm. but i started listening to it more closely recently um so I'm going to talk a bit about Nixon in China, and I think in the finished uh, show I'm going to in- include some excerpts and use oh, yeah. bits of opening and closing music. So some of the music is really, really pretty special. It's special. The, it's very reminiscent in parts of Philip Glass. In fact, mm-hmm. when I first heard it, I was like, did Glass actually like collaborate on this directly? Or what? Because passages of it, especially the use of... of um, clarinets playing these repeating figures these scale figures uh, really sound like his style and i guess adams was just uh, doing like homage to his style i guess in parts of this yeah in parts well i gotta say i'm not a big fan of philip glass i am a big fan of phil glass i'm not but (laughs) i can see how i can see how his work influenced this yes this however is um it is not minimalist. And, you know, some bits of it, there are parts where it, the music just kind of dries up and becomes minimal. Um, but uh, in other places, it becomes crazy. Like, layers and layers of melody and very complex rhythm. And I would even say it becomes maximalist in places. Right. You know, like, how much stuff can we throw in here? Uh, oftentimes the music is a riot of melodic shifts, rhythmic passages playing against each other, sometimes uh, not exactly dissonant, but it uses these huge intervals that are a little startling. They kind of wake you up, you know, and and you may think, this is off key, you know, singing, well, the, the opera singers are not singing off key, that's how it's scored. That's how it's scored, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a passage I'm going to try and find for the show where there's a group of singers all singing at once, each of them seemingly in a different key and each of them seemingly in a different meter. Right, and I think... But the, not actually? Well, it's it's scored that way. I mean, you know, they must have... They must have worked very hard to create that sense of chaos, right? right. Because if you're all singing together, you would tend to fall into each other's yeah, meter and right. in, in, into rhythm with each other. But to try to stay deliberately in a, sen- in a sense of chaos right. is hard, I can right. imagine. Um, so technically, this opera is, it must have been uh, extremely challenging, right, for the singers. Right. It must The rehearsals must have been remarkable. Um, so... Genius. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the effect is not actually chaos, but it conveys chaos. So we're hearing the music demonstrating the clashing messages and agendas of the different characters, kind of all at once. Mm-hmm. Um, some of it does occasionally rise to genuinely difficult to listen to, as in this is, you know, modern, yeah, <laughs> right? That would be the part that reminds me of film class. Yeah, yeah, and challenging, right? Um, okay. However, I've been listening around to other things, and it's not nearly as difficult as something else I've been listening to bits of on YouTube, which is a, an opera by Philip Glass called Einstein on the Beach. Um, Einstein on the Beach, I'll have to play you some bits of it, uh, just, just so you get a sense of how crazy it is. It's, it sounds it's, like it's off the wall. It's off the wall. It's five hours long, and individual songs often just consist of 
uh, literally repeated phrases involving numbers and you know the solfege notes do re mi do yeah, re mi fa la yeah. so ti do and those phrases that, like repeated in cycles against each other right for a song might involve like seven minutes of, of, See, <laughs> of these repeating so figures glass is just a hater <laughs> I mean, really, he's just a hateful man, honestly. I, I, I don't believe that, but I okay, think he right. was. I think he was really pushing. This is definitely you would call it experimental. He's really pushing the boundary of like what, what you need happens. To force to to. <laughs> well, what happens to your attention when the something becomes truly minimal in this sense? And I, I, I think he was. Uh, this is the piece was written quite a while back i think he was into notions from zen buddhism and meditation and attempting to create a like, trance-like effect like trying to induce a fugue state induce a fugue state <laughs> yeah the audience goes berserk and starts killing each other they have no memory <laughs> afterwards of why no fascinating <laughs> my work here is done <laughs> <laughs> something <laughs> something like that but you know glass works one of my favorite works of music ever really does induce a sort of blissful trance. If I used to listen to it on headphones all the time on my Walkman, like my cassette Walkman, I would listen to Glassworks while, like, right. you know. And I guarantee you that very few other people out there with Walkman on, like, out riding their bikes or whatever, and listen to Philip Glass. we're listening to <laughs> in high school. <laughs> we're listening to uh, Philip Glass. Yeah. Anyway, um, so maybe I'll talk about Einstein on the beach another time. That's genuinely hard. I, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, you know, I don't. I can't say that I like it. Actually, no. yeah. Um, this CD, I like parts of it a lot, and other parts less so. Uh, I've had hard time making sense of the libretto. I had to go to a website where it was all written out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. You can understand the words. Um, just listening to the music, it's hard to make sense of what's going on because a lot of stuff doesn't make literal sense. Oh, and I think you were saying also that this, well, what you have is not the whole, not even a whole for act. Yeah, so it's that... Of, so it's like bits and pieces of one act out of one. I was initially listening to this disc and thinking that it was the opera and like would get to the end of it like that didn't make any it's sense what the hell was happening and actually i only recently discovered that this cd is actually a single cd set of excerpts from the opera and it's right. like two thirds of act 1 a couple songs from act 2 and one song and nothing at all from act 3 yeah so right? so it doesn't make any sense no it doesn't make any sense it doesn't it's even finish for someone who's heard it before yeah it doesn't even finish an act right, right. so like it's just uh, you don't even understand it jumps the 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 uh, songs which were like transitions and introduction to new scenes are missing so you go from mm -hmm. one scene one song to the middle of another the scene, scene right? right it's it's very like oh now i understand why it doesn't make any sense so because I have this iTunes store credit, I just downloaded two complete versions of, I like $125 on the iTunes store credit. Yeah, no, nothing you want to buy. And I couldn't think of anything I wanted to buy. So, but I'm like, oh, I'm listening to, to uh, anyway, so I downloaded. Um, the whole thing? Two recordings of. Uh, two recordings Nixon of the whole in thing. China. Okay, there you right. go. So, um, yeah, I want to. It, it gets a little crazy. Um, mm -hmm. the, the there's a complicated relationship with time and space in the opera. The way things move around, characters are talking about the past. They're talking about sort of abstractions. They're talking about the future and the present jumbled around. Um, when they meet, when uh, Nixon sings that his flight was smooth, and he drags the word "smooth" out into something like ten syllables, oh, right? Yes. <laughs> And they're smooth. And um, it's like he's actually just trying to think of something to say. Like he's uh, he, he's repeating back to his host this word smooth. And he, it looks like a dork, you know. So it's conveying that he was... And then he sort of kind of blathers about how they had to go through all these time zones and whatnot. You right. know? So it conveys a lot about his character in a few words. You know, oh, like yeah, yeah. what they choose to include and not include. 
Um, smoother than usual, yes. He, he keeps wandering away from the present. He goes into like reverie and then mm-hmm. sometimes into paranoia. Mm-hmm. So he invokes the moon landing. He says, we live in an unsettled time. Who are our enemies? Who are our friends? The Eastern Hemisphere beckoned to us, and we have flown east of the sun, west of the moon, across an ocean of distrust, filled with the bodies of our lost, the Earth's sea of tranquility. That, of course, was a famous clip of audio from the moon landing. He Mm -hmm. told the astronauts, talk to us from the sea of tranquility, where that's where they landed. Right. Right. It's prime time in the USA, yesterday night. They watch us now, the three main networks, colors glow, livid through drapes, onto the lawn. Dishes are washed and homework done. The dogs and grandma fall asleep. A car roars past, playing loud pop, is gone. And I look down the road. I know America is good at heart. An old cold warrior piloting towards an unknown shore through shoals. The rats begin to chew the sheets. There's murmuring below. Oh my. Yeah, so I'll, I'll include a clip there. Um, so following along with just audio, like just listening to this, it's not really clear what's going on because you don't know what's happening on stage. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a phrase from Vonnegut in Slaughterhouse-Five, Billy Pilgrim, uh, says that he has become unstuck in time. And when you're listening to this, it kind of has the effect of making you feel unstuck in time. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, really? Rats? Where? <laughs> um, anyway. And, you know, it's a real juxtaposition to all the language that just came before it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to mention one more thing about this. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to say that um, you know, I, haven't, I haven't listened to the entire three CD set yet. Um, but my overall review leans towards something like quite flawed, but also very ambitious, interesting, and beautiful in parts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to say one thing, too, that the librettos take on the notion of history in people's lives and how they perceive their role and place in history is much more interesting, much more thoughtful, and much more complex then in Hamilton. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. is another musical that takes history as its subject. They, ha- they have songs right. with passages that, excuse me, that go, history has its eye on you, you know, or making yeah. history. They're aware of their role in history. Right. But in um, Nixon in China, different characters have very jaundiced and different views about history there's a line from Mao Zedong history is a dirty sow if we by chance escape her ma she overlies us that is like rolls over and smothers you right <laughs> even she doesn't eat you yeah wow yeah that's kind of a job just for me. it's a little dark yeah alright you right. see it though <laughs> so anyway Nixon in China check it out Check it out, Funk Soul Brother. There are there are actually are complete versions on YouTube. I won't link to them because I think they're pirated, but you can find one if you, you can like. find one if you like. Right. Yeah. So we recorded a hot take on the events in Charlottesville last August thirteenth. A year ago, t- tomorrow, but like a year ago this, yeah. this weekend. Um, as we record this, there are rallies and protests happening in D.C. We are actually in danger of. Tonight's show being overtaken by events that that may be happening now. I was sure. following along on Twitter because these are the anniversary rallies and protests. Mm-hmm. One year ago today was the Charlottesville car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured 19 other people. Yeah. That was... People forget about the 19. The 19 other folks that were injured and attacked. And one guy who apparently was attacked by a group of white supremacists and then had charges brought against him? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to mention him. Okay, yeah. Cuz I had to look up like where things stand because, you know, the news media is really bad at follow-up. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um it has to be the hot topic and it, they don't go back and say where are they now and what's happening. Yeah, no. Not unless they're like, you know, child stars. 
Right. <laughs> so the the attacker, the guy that drove the car into the crowd, um, yeah. has not been tried yet, but his hearing is set for for November. A hearing? His court court appearance. Okay, but is he going to trial or trial? Okay, so his trial is set for November. Yeah. Okay. You know, hearings usually. I'm never sorry. Mind. sorry. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, his murder charge was initially uh, a second degree murder charge. It's been mm-hmm. up, updated, upgraded to a first degree, degree murder, murder charge based on additional footage, like uh, helicopter camera footage, right? And uh, like additional camera footage. Mm-hmm. Um, a number of counts of aggravated malicious wounding, mm-hmm. and malicious wounding. And he's been charged with 28 counts of federal hate crimes. Whoa, 28. <sighs> so. Dang. So. I'm glad to see this guy charged with something. Yes. But again, for the record, right. not, a fan for, not a fan of hate crimes. It's effectively a thought crime, but carry on. I don't think it's really going to matter if he's convicted. I think it's just going to make his sentence from the rest of his life in prison to the rest of his life in In prison prison. plus, you know, more years. Or whatever. Although, you know... We'll see. It'll be interesting to see what what his uh, sentencing looks like. Yeah, we'll see. We don't have to wait that much longer to see that happen. There also was uh, a guy, DeAndre Harris. Yeah. uh, Who was beaten by six men on camera. Mm -hmm. One of them has been convicted for malicious wounding. Mm-hmm. Three more are charged and waiting for trial. Okay. So that's happening. But yeah, this is the guy I'm going to quote from Wikipedia. In a move that surprised both activists and the Charlottesville Police Department, Merlin Gushel, a local magistrate, signed a warrant on October 9th, 2017, without the involvement of the Charlottesville Police for the arrest of DeAndre Harris on a felony, felony charge of unlawful wounding. The charge was later downgraded to a misdemeanor assault charge. So, <laughs> there's that. This was the guy who had a spinal injury, lacerations to the head. He was beaten with a metal pipe and yeah. wooden boards. You yeah. know, uh, The charge arose from the claim of Harold Cruz, the state chairman of the White Supremacist League of the South, mm-hmm. that, Harris had been at, that Harris had attacked him. Um, white supremacists portrayed the incident of Harris getting beaten as an act of self-defense for a purported attack on the white supremacists who actually committed the beating of Harris. Mm. So, it sounds a lot like stop, stop hitting my fist with your jaw, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like you see, my, my fist is, my knuckles are all bloody. Stop resisting arrest, <laughs> right? If you would stop just stop yourself. resisting. Stop hitting yourself. What? <laughs> so it's a little more complicated than that. Um, Cruz was actually trying to spear another black counter-protester, Corey Long, with a pole of a Confederate flag, which prompted Harris to strike him with his flashlight, right? Oh, Harris right. was defending another guy. There's footage of this footage where of they it. were trying to stab him with a flagpole with a it's Confederate a- flag on it. How horrible and symbolic is that? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, Harris was released and then turned himself in to the Charlottesville Police Department after turning himself in. He was acquitted of this. Uh, The judge found out that the evidence was clearly proven that it was, in fact, Harris who acted in the defense of a third party. Right. And the defense of a third party is a form of self defense. It's considered a form of self defense law. It right. is a defense, right? Right. You saw someone attacking another person and you stepped in between to defend the person being attacked. Yeah. That's and a Har- thing. Harris, without previously formed intent, struck Cruz with a flashlight when Cruz attacked Harris's friend. Right. And that was considered legitimate use of defense. Right, yeah. right. So, you know, so, some of those things. Anyway, but the, so the fallout from this is still happening. The fallout oh, from yeah. Charlottesville. A rally today remembering Heather Heyer. Mm-hmm. And um, there are people traveling to these events. And there's right. this dispute over whether uh, white supremacists were going to get like a private 
train car, whether they're going to get special coddling and defense by the police and the authorities in order to to be able to, uh, you know, go to their protests. Unscathed. Unscathed. Dangerous protesters. Without those dangerous counter protesters. Attacking them. Uh, So I want to talk about no platforming and fascism and Antifa. Well, that's yeah. That's today. I think right. That's our. That's our topic. That's the meat of our topic today. Right. Uh, the The title of the show is remembering Heather Heyer, but I think we can say without the Irony risk, or risk right? without the risk of sounding too ludicrous or ironic that I want to talk about this, these things in memory of Heather Heyer. So yeah, yeah. Who died fighting fascism? Right on. So, Mark Bray. From Teen Vogue, this is actually from an article about Antifa, mm-hmm. but we'll get to Bray and Antifa a little bit in a bit. But, yeah, but yeah. this Let's is start with Teen Vogue. He was asked in an interview, and there's a link in the show notes. What is no platforming, and why does the Antifa movement partake in it? Mm-hmm. He said, "No platforming is preventing white supremacists and neo-Nazi groups from having a platform to organize and promote their politics." The reasoning behind why anti-fascists argue that these groups should be deprived of a platform is that they look to the historical examples of fascist and white supremacist groups growing and point out quite accurately that the way they grow is by becoming normalized. Yes. By establishing themselves in communities, building relationships in workplaces, in the cultural milieu So if you want to prevent these groups from taking even the first step toward normalizing their politics, you deprive them of a platform to even take that first step. Yes. So we're not going to talk right now about whether we think this is a good thing or not, but that's part of the subject. That's the idea. We're talking about what it is and why. Mm -hmm. Anti-fascists argue that white supremacy is not simply a difference of opinion. No, no, it's it's a different paradigm. Politics that aim to deprive people of their humanity should not be treated as differing opinions, but as threats to society that need to be stopped. Right. Some of the most high-profile examples of no-platform politics recently in the U.S. have to do with shutting down far-right speakers like Milo Yiannopoulos. Mm -hmm. The argument that anti-fascist and anti-racist student groups put forward is that If we really want to promote free and open discourse on campuses and in society, then allowing the promotion of white supremacist, transphobic, or anti-immigrant sentiment promotes the dehumanization of significant numbers of people and actually is antithetical to building the kind of diverse, free, and open discourse that we all want. Mm -hmm. Moreover, these kinds of events often serve as points of recruitment for far-right groups. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's why, they, that's why they're having them. And help to embolden and mobilize students and community members who carry out their violence later on. Right. So. Yeah. And you may have seen it online. Like, the, there's a meme, like the paradox of tolerance. Yeah. that's uh, I've got actually a quote from that. Yeah. That, that you know. To stick in the end of the. tolerated if you're going to have a tolerant society. Um. So uh, actually, I've I got a quote from Popper to to read a little okay. a little later yeah. on, but um, I wanted to talk about a couple of these recent examples of contested speech mm-hmm. and this issue of how they can be tolerated and whether. And again, I'm not claiming to come up with absolutely definitive answers in all these, but I want to oh, give right. our, no. our takes. Our takes, sure. First up. First up, I got two articles, again, linked in the show notes, about Sarah Jong. Okay. Yep. She is a Korean-American um, hired by the New York Times. Yep. And when she was hired, conservative, quote, researchers, unquote. Yeah, I mean, you, you, they call themselves that, and you see people on Twitter, thank you for your amazing research. research. When someone has done or, and journalism, they say, thank you for your amazing journalism. When someone has just sat at a computer and done a search on someone's Twitter timeline, right? Yeah. 
yeah. And then just taking screenshots, like, okay, th- uh, that's, that was a thing, but you know, yeah, you, you did, did something. you did something, but um, you know, journalism used to mean going out and talking to people, for example. Anyway, so this is in defense of Sarah Jong by Zach Bouchamp. This is from mm-hmm. Vox. Sorry about the source. I'm not really a huge fan of Vox, but oh, uh, yeah. I've grown, I've grown sour on Vice myself. But, Vice. Uh, yeah. well, maybe I'm confusing the two. Yeah, uh, you may be confusing Vox and Vice. <clears throat> Vice can go to hell, but All right. carry on. Conservatives are up in arms over the New York Times' latest hire, a tech writer named Sarah Jong, whom they allege to be racist against white people. <gasps> So I'm not going to read all of this, but um, they have dug up old tweets containing statements like white men are bullshit. And oh, man, it's kind of sick how much joy I get out of being cruel to old white men. (laughs) See, you're you're laughing. The campaign to use these tweets to get her fired seems to have failed. The Times issued a statement saying that Zhang had meant these tweets satirically, a parody of the hate that she has received online as an Asian woman. Right. Now, they also said she regrets using this tactic and you know, doesn't plan to use it. something like you know she sees Sorry. now that this was divisive, this was divisive and has regret you know hurtful or whatnot. And I think that was bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's bullshit. But carry on. Yeah. They needed they need to defend their their people if they're going to keep them on. I mean, actually defend them. Right. They either defend them whole you know wholeheartedly. No. Or don't hire them or, or right. fire them, you know. Right. But don't but, like yeah. be mealy mouthed about it and says, Oh, she says she's very sorry and she will never do it again. It was because bad. actually I admire what she did. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well and, and let's be very clear. The the conservatives responding here have fallen into what I frequently describe as a trap. Yeah. Racism is systemic. Yeah. Bigotry is personal. Yeah. I don't think we should have a problem with bigotry everyone's got some kind of bigotry i don't i also i don't believe that any of the conservative um commentators and writers who have are spreading garbage about this topic are actually operating in good faith none of them were confused none of them believe that this woman writing tweets is really what they say you know, and had nothing to do with her treatment and wasn't part of a different context and a different argument online. But oh, right. I'll right. get to that. So sure. National Review's David French, New York Magazine's Andrew Sullivan. <laughs> I'm not going to say that much. Uh, Sullivan says, The neo-Marxist analysis of society in which we were all mere appendages of various groups of oppressors and oppressed and in which the oppressed definitionally cannot be at fault, is now the governing philosophy of almost all liberal media. Mm. Oh, tell me more, oh bald-headed one. <laughs> oh, come on. You know, I've been saying that Andrew Sullivan just needs to go home for a while oh, now. But... <laughs> Can we get I mean, him deported? To where? Uh, isn't he from the UK? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is he from the UK? I mean, I'm confused with someone else. I think he is. I think he's from the, okay, carry on. Anyway. Uh, no, liberal media is not neo-Marxist. <laughs> Just as an aside. So the writer also... Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm skipping ahead a, a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, the writer says... Um, I have a lot of respect for Andrew. He gave me my first job in journalism. Okay, you know, make that your lead. Lead. And then say, by the way, I'm unable to finish this article because I I have too much personal bias, right? For example. Anyway, skipping ahead. The basic, he does finish it and he does make his points, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The basic thrust of both Sullivan and French's argument is that if you sub the only, any group other than white people for what that substituted in mm-hmm. any group other than white people for what Zhang wrote, then it would be obviously offensive. Hmm. Cancel black people probably wouldn't fly at the New York Times, would it? <laughs> Sullivan asks. Just ask Rhetorically. Him. And, okay, the only reason lefties aren't offended by this obvious race-based hatred, the argument goes, is that they see the world entirely through the lens of power. Since whites as a class have it, minorities by definition cannot harbor racist attitudes toward them. Okay. Well, I actually think that's true. Uh, Yeah, that's true. 
in that it's true in this sense. There's this statement attributed to Margaret Atwood, I think, about mm-hmm. how women, or men are afraid women will laugh at them. Women are afraid men will kill them. Right. Right. That those things are different. There is no writer at the New York Times or Conservative National Review or, or whatever right. that actually has anything to fear from this woman. No, right. And they know that. They know that. Absolutely. No no white no white man. Right. Mm-hmm. They know that. Yeah. It's n- that's not a missing piece of information. Mm-hmm. But it really, it just comes back to what I like to point out. Yes, that's absolutely true. Racism only works one way from pre- from the people with power to the people towards the people with no power. Yeah, it punches down. Any, but you, any person you, can have bigotry. You make the distinction that she could be expressing bigotry. Sure. However, I would claim, and this author also claims, it's not even bigotry. It's not even bigotry because she is satire satirizing right. the comments that like, she's gotten. Like she she's not a bigot just like Carol O'Connor's not a bigot. Right. right. And yeah, yeah. she's the thing is all the context is lost and that's sort of the next some of the next points about this is right. that you take individual tweets which actually were in conversations with right. people attacking her. Right. Uh you know or she was retweeting people attacking her and adding right. and tagging them. Right. Right. It, over time, all that context gets lost on Twitter. And it's, yeah, yeah. The problem here is assuming Zhang's words were meant literally. Mm-hmm. That when Zhang wrote, cancel white people, hashtag, right. she was literally calling for white genocide. genocide. And that's what these conservative, like, crocodile tear are folks asserting, right. are claiming. Right. Including... Our boy Rod. Yeah, yeah. That, that who's they like don't... serious about it. I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, there's a certain like, <sighs> I don't understand the internet. What's yes. happening here? I, I see that a lot, actually. So, uh, Andrew Sullivan calls her language eliminationist. Hmm. We use that term to refer to people who are literally talking about eliminating people and, people, yeah. and who may have influence. Towards to do getting so. it done. Right. Right. Well, people who are literally advocating genocide. Yes. Right. And I think it's a stretch to suggest that she was literally advocating genocide. <laughs> so you, yeah. you cannot read her tweets in context. And reach that conclusion. Yeah. So, okay. I, I haven't read any of the tweets. I believe you. Yeah. Eliminist language in the way it's used by scholars of genocide and racial oppression is used as justification for concrete actions. Mm-hmm. The Holocaust, the Rwandan genocide, mm-hmm. the very idea that Sarah Jong's tweets reveal her desire to set up concentration camps for whites is laughable. It's unlikely that she, she, she doesn't even dislike white people. Yeah, no. She dislikes harassment. You know? Right. Anyway. The meaning of the phrase white people is obvious to people who have been listening to these social media conversations. Mm-hmm. So... Then the author gets into, you know, how do black people and other people of color talk about white people when they're among friends, right? Oh, right, yeah. And points out, one thing I, this is a quote from a Twitter account called Studio Glibly. If you're a white person who's never heard people of color talk about white people before the advent of social media... It probably means that no people of color, even your friends, have ever truly trusted you. <laughs> that's probably what that means. And I think that's a really good point. Like right. people who like take this at face value because they've never been at the barbecue. Right. They're yeah. shocked, clutching their pearls. <gasps> How could because, they say such things? Because to them, it's like for people with no skin in the game, Right. the rhetoric is the most important thing. Oh, right. Uh, that's hardly the, the real experience of the real experience of the game or the thing right. uh, where, where people who are suffering under these power structures mm-hmm. can't get any traction literally under police misconduct under you know can't get a mortgage can't get a house, house can't get, get a job not harassed for a day prosecute yeah, yeah. prosecutorial mis- misconduct etc you know, they're just layers and layers yeah so you know 
So I don't know. This is obvious to people who are steeped in this kind of online communities. This is the, the author. Mm-hmm. Uh, a few alt-right websites pull out Zhang's tweets in a deliberate attempt to hurt her career and reputation. What's actually happening here is a racist movement. The alt-right trying to damage a left-wing woman of color and mainstream conservatives piling on and jumping on to further the narrative. Right? Isn't that ironic? It's all about the narrative. I mean, Caitlin, Caitlin Johnston is, is right in this right. regard. Who controls the rhetoric controls, controls the, the world. world. <laughs> but no, but I, I just want to note the irony. Yeah. They're, they're using racism to call her bigotry racist. <laughs> you noticed that, huh? Isn't that weird? Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Okay, carry on. All right, I'm going to skip ahead because uh, we're not going to talk about um, how this. Sullivan has posted uh, debating the question of whether blacks are genetically less intelligent than whites. And, yeah, we're not going to discuss that. All that race science bullshit. Um, because, yeah. Yeah. But he still has a job. Okay. He still has a job. So... Anyway, so that's that's this article, Zach Beauchamp. Mm-hmm. Next one. Next. More Vox. More Vox. Yeah. The problem with Twitter, as shown by the Sarah Jong fracas. Right. Ezra Klein. Oh, he's all right. All right. Yeah, he's a liberal. Yeah. Right. Um, not a radical, not a leftist. I, but... Yeah, I wouldn't invite him over, but you know. <laughs> I, I've read things of his that I appreciated. Well, no, I mean the the difference is that I I can't bring myself to read Andrew Sullivan's. Like, oh, read Andrew Sullivan's article. I'm like, yeah, no. Yeah, at National this is uh, this is Klein writing at mm-hmm. National Review. Jonah Goldberg has a column on the Sarah Jong fracas that is wrong in I think a useful way. Oh, a useful. Way. That's okay. how they. That's the best they can usually manage to contribute to the dialogue, right? To be uh, instructively wrong. I, I've got more than that from National Review, but mostly yes. <laughs> when I was a youngish teenager, I went to the bank one day. This was pre-ATM machines, kids. Ooh. I stood in line behind a very old, very properly dressed white lady, complete with a sort of fancy hat that I still don't know the proper name for. <laughs> It's a fan that says close. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Depends on the time of year, but carry on. When she got to the teller, I didn't pay attention at first, but very quickly my ears perked up. She earned my attention because this prim old woman was passionately raining racial, uh, racial epithets at the bank teller, who was an Asian American woman. Yeah. I have no idea what the bank teller's specific ethnicity was. Of course he doesn't, you sensitive little snowflake who can't tell the difference between Asian people and should never have to learn that. As you were. I have no idea. Uh, But the old lady seemed to roam the waterfront between nips, gooks, slants, etc. You Hmm. damn gooks killed my husband and my son, I distinctly remember her saying. Oh, this oh. might have been like actually during the Vietnam, Vietnam War. War. <laughs> right, yeah. Ezra Klein's not a spring chicken. Yeah, or maybe after the Korean War. Uh, uh, well, he's not that old. Okay. Yeah. The moral, Goldberg says, is this. The old, white, old lady was wrong to do what she did. She may have had plenty of rationalizations and explanations for why she tormented that young woman, but none of them added up to an excuse. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you know, I guess that's... Blah, blah, blah. Carry on. Much of the Zhang Fuhrer has been about actually racist alt-right trolls weaponizing old tweets in bad faith to get an Asian woman fired from an important job. Right. Goldberg's piece traces another fault line in the Zhang debate, one that I see people of good faith struggling with even days after the initial frenzy. Are Zhang's tweets the equivalent of Goldberg's old woman yelling racial slurs at a bank teller? That is to say, are they an actual expression of animus toward real people? Or are the critics making that argument engaged in an absurd form of literalism, refusing to recognize ironic discourse, even though it's been repeatedly pointed out to them? Or just recognizing <clears throat> context. I mean, really, just, just recognizing that, you know, this is the funniest page, not an editorial, and not the front page. Right. And uh, uh, Goldberg goes on, uh, the, the author of this piece says, A few years ago, it became popular on feminist Twitter to tweet about the awful effects of patriarchal culture and attack the line, kill all men, the hashtag kill all men. Right. 
This became popular enough that a bunch of people I know and hang out with and even love began using it in casual conversation. Right, right, right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re- uh, recall the phrase, which I'm sure you heard in feminist circles, mm-hmm. if we can put one man on the moon, why not, why not all, all of them? them? <laughs> that, taken literally, is eliminationist <laughs> rhetoric, right? Does right. anyone believe that in context that women were secretly conspiring to like actually put all men on the moon in concentration camps on the, the moon. moon. <laughs> that was the plan. We were hiding it in plain sight. We were hiding it. Okay. <laughs> so very yeah. well done, I must say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Still working on it. What do you think Space Force is? <laughs> oh we're <God>. in deep. <laughs> He says, you know what? I didn't like it. It made me feel defensive. Oh. <laughs> oh. It still makes me feel defensive. Yeah. I'm a man and I recoil hearing people I care about say all men should be killed. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. <laughs> But I also knew that wasn't what they're saying. It's it, So he's 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 saying, yes, it, it was did make him feel a little touchy, but he knew that it was that was the point. That was the point. To make you feel touchy, but not to actually plan to kill yes. you. Yes. They didn't yeah. want to put me to death. Well, maybe him, but uh, yeah. they, they didn't hate me and they didn't hate men. Kill all men was another way of saying it. it would be nice if the world sucked less for women. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was an expression of frustration with pervasive sexism. Sure. All right. So I'm skipping ahead because there's a lot of sort of filler material, but he cites some of these tweets. She's responding to a tweet. That looks like, if I saw you, Sarah Jong, if I saw you, I would sock you right in your lesbian face. Sarah Jong, shut the fuck up, you dog-eating gook. <laughs> right. Right. Um, that's the kind of tweet that she was responding to. to. Right. And that's the kind of tweet, her responses are the kind of answers that people find when they search her timeline. Right. And oftentimes the originals are long gone because people have been banned or deleted their accounts or etc. or blocked people or blocked their accounts or and It's interesting. You know, this is just interesting to me. That no one seemed to think it was like, I don't know, inappropriate to attack her in this to way. To attack her. Like to attack her in this way. Right. Like to say those things to her. Right. They're not National yeah, Review's yeah. not writing articles about these men harassing Sarah John online. atmosphere online. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. No. Further comments. Twitter is weird, and I agree with this. A huge yeah. amount of what's written there is metatextual commentary. It is a, a classically, you know, going back to the early years of um, software design, you would call it a hypertext. Right. Right. Um, on other tweets intended for a knowing audience reading in a specific moment. And it's even more complicated than that because the web of permissions is different for everyone reading. Right, right. So So you may be missing swaths of the conversation. A lot of it, or seeing parts that other people aren't. Uh, Right. Uh, You see everyone reading their Twitter timeline now has a completely different experience from everyone else, right? Right. Uh, It's an ephemeral self-referential mode of discourse that is unfortunately not ephemeral, or tied to reference points at all. Mm-hmm. It's designed to be broadcast, archived, search, and embedded by anyone in any context at any point in the future. Hmm. There's a term for this. It's called context collapse, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it basically happens in a variety of electronic media like this when, when the historic context is lost. Yeah, and in fairness, it was a campaign like this by liberals they got Matt Brunig fired from his job at the, at the National Labor Board. Yep. yep. But carry on. So now their liberals are like, hey, we have to appreciate the context here. Well, here's some of the context restored, right? One of Jong's most vocal critics was Sullivan, who wrote a slashing column accusing her of, quote, eliminationist, unquote, rhetoric, among other sins. It turns out that one of the tweets he was referencing was about him. Though he didn't know it and certainly didn't take time to trace it back and find out. So she actually was writing, it was in a a discussion about him. That's hilarious. And let me see if I can read this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, this is the oh the dogs pissing on a fire hydrant thing. It's you know what it's very hard for me to read in print here, so mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to skip it. But Andrew Prokop, a play in three acts, mm-hmm. twelve twenty two twenty fourteen. Scully or Sully, that is Sullivan, mm-hmm. defends running infamous race IQ essay. Right. Twelve twenty three. Jong parodies his both sides logic on Twitter. Right. Eight oh three. Sully sees that old tweet, doesn't realize it's making fun of him, and calls her a racist. Racist. Yeah, her old tweet. I think in context was, "Are white people okay?" So the original thing was literally about black people with lower IQs, right? Right. Um, her comment. Are white people genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun, thus logically... I can't read it, unfortunately. Let me try. Uh, Oh, only... uh, Logically being fit, only fit to live underground like groveling goblins? (laughs) Just asking. Just asking the question. In context, it's both hilarious and appropriate to the... To the debate, to the right? debate, to what to the assertions that he was making about black people, which were literally about whether your genetic fitness for different kinds of activities. Activity, right? right. So I'm just wondering here about white people and like how they burn in the sun. Yeah, but then you pull that out and drop the context, and he himself pulled that out pulled and, and drop the context. Get the context didn't, didn't get it or, right, right? Yeah, so. He's not a digital native. All right. Part of constructing your community on Twitter is bounding it. Part of winning retweets and likes is sending missives your community will love. Given how human beings police group boundaries, that means making jokes only your friends understand. Right. All communities do this. Yes. In jokes are part of what makes communities. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, professional communities use their own professional language their to lingo. obfuscate the lingo so that they yeah. recognize and talk to each other. Make jargonizing. It, yeah. Jargonizing. In, you know, ethnic groups use their own lingo. lingo. Yeah. Families. Fa- everyone does it. Even in small families. Even right. in you know, the contexts of two. Right. You've got your in People jokes. have in-jokes and pet phrases and whatnot that don't make sense literally. It makes a little more sense and will be yeah. confusing to anyone outside. Yeah. Twitter is a medium that rewards us for a snark, for sick burns, for edgy jokes and cruel comments that deepen the grooves of our group. It's designed to make the sickest of those burns and the worst of those jokes go viral. Yes. Those two things are profoundly <laughs> at odds, right? Yes. Well, and... So yeah, good yeah. for he says uh, Klein says that's good for engagement on the platform, but often bad for the people it happens it's to. Too. And you see yeah. this the way that you can get dragged, like you suddenly a tweet in your in group mm-hmm. gets posted, someone retweets it who's a high profile alt right guy or something, and or suddenly whatever. your mentions are all on fire with racist, on fire with racist uh, and, Nazis and that doxing you and showing up at your doxing house and all death threats, shit. Yeah, yeah, calling your employer, right? So, blah blah blah. Yeah. Did you hear what she said on Twitter? So I'm skipping ahead. Um, Twitter is not your friend. It's built to reward us for snarky in-group communications and designed to encourage unintended out-group readership. It fosters both tribalism and tribal collision. Mm -hmm. If you're a conservative, the liberal tweets that get shot into your sight line aren't the most thoughtful or representative missives. They're the ones designed to make you think liberals hate you, are idiots, or both. Mm, yeah. The same is true if you're a liberal. You see the worst of the right, not the best. Right. You're correct. After you've seen enough of these kinds of comments from one side, you start to think that's who they are and that you're getting a true picture of what your opponents really are up to, like talking about, etc. Right. All right. Not a true picture. It's a distortion built to deepen your attachment to your friends, your resentment of your opponents, and your engagement on the platform. Mm. It's one that plays on our tendencies to read the other side with much less generosity than we read our own side. Right. right. Okay. So I thought that, that was a good comment. So that's the affair Jong. Hmm. And 
like how Here, here's how it, oh, here, yeah, go here's how it plays out oh okay yeah, yeah okay that's what i was waiting for national review oh. gray lady dawns white hood god damn <laughs> by g roy murdoch <laughs> Subtitle, apparently it isn't racist to be racist if it's against the right race. Hmm. Notice how right race sounds just like white race, right? Um, Interesting, that. It's official. These are the United States of double standards. Oh. For the latest proof, look no further than the controversy embroiling Twitter and America's disgraced so-called paper of record. Yeah, actually, I agree with that, right? They are disgraced, and they are a so-called paper paper of record, record. but not for this. Not for this reason, yeah. Conservative activist Candace Owens of Turning Point USA was banned, albeit briefly, from Twitter on Sunday. Her sin? She critiqued a number of breathtakingly racist Twitter comments from Sarah Jong, the gray lady's recently hired editorial page writer. Wait, wait, who's the gray lady? The New York Times. The Grey Lady is the New York Times. Got yeah. it. Okay, all right. Yeah. I thought they were referring to Sarah Jong as the Grey Lady. No. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, it's like, you know, from a distance, newspapers look gray. Oh, yeah. The, the, yeah. Pa- the paper no, is gray. I, I get it now, but yeah. I thought they were referring to her. Yeah. Go, carry, carry on. Uh, Owens illustrated how jaw-droppingly bigoted Jung's comments were by substituting black and Jewish for white. For example, Jewish people are bullshit, like dogs pissing on fire hydrants. Canceled Jewish people. Are Jewish people genetically <laughs> disposed to burn faster in the sun? Good question. Editors note, not. National Review's policy is to replace some letters and indecent words with asterisks. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're worried that their own readers <laughs> like, <laughs> will, will dissolve in the sunlight if they're exposed to the F word, right, with all its letters intact. Well, you know. Ugh. Well, they're not actually worried about that. Just to be clear, I think Paul's making a set satirical statement uh, really? about their concerns. <laughs> really? I do. You know, I'd hate for some someone to take my words out of context. context. <laughs> I don't understand what we mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, uh, uh, Owen's argument by analogy was a perfectly appropriate rhetorical device, especially since she explained this technique in her post. So. The above statements are from NY Times editor Sarah Jong. I simply swapped out the word white for Jewish. For this, Twitter closed Owen's account, although it later reversed course after a backlash erupted. Hmm. So there. If enough people complain about your tweets, then you're temporarily blocked until a human actually reviews the tweets. Right. Right. So. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. I'm not going to read all the tweets. Please don't. Um, skip, I mean, we're skipping ahead. So, she, yeah. so skipping ahead, let's just say that the author of this piece just recites them all, right, right. with no context. Recites all the tweets with no context and, and exclamation points. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh my God. Yeah. Right. It is inconceivable that the Eighth Avenue font of left wing orthodoxy would hire anyone who wrote Kill More Women. And yet Zhang declared via Twitter in 2014, kill more men. In 2015, she sped beyond mere misandry and actually advocated anti-male gender side. <gasps> kill all the men. Oh, my God. If you are reading this, white male, Zhang has you in her crosshairs. <laughs> you can practically, you can finish the sentences, right? They're so predictable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. John could have followed Michelle Obama's oft-quoted, widely rejected advice to her fellow leftists. Michelle Obama's not a leftist. When they go low, we go high. Well, that's fine for Michelle Obama, right? <laughs> I think that's just fine for her. She can, she can do that. John could go have right rejected ahead. the racist cracks lobbed at her and slammed by name the bigots behind them. Now, maybe she should have doxxed them. They would have loved that, right? Well, that could have been good. Yeah. yeah. This would have exposed these creeps and served them their richly deserved opprobrium. Yeah, because white racists are so terrified of being called out for by an Asian racist. woman on Twitter. For being a white racist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, 
Instead of handling things, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, Zhang repeatedly condemned an entire race just for the color of their skin. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> this is the dictionary definition of Jim Crow era racial prejudice. Actually, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> but how's let... it not? Oh, <laughs> okay, so Jim Crow era. Yes. Racism. Yes. Was actually codifying a law that was structural racism. That was structural racism. Yeah. That institutional, you know, legally you can't enter this. It's like the way people get confused about the First Amendment. Right. Okay. Right. When the law says you can't enter the front door of this building because of the color of your skin. Right. That is structural racism. Right. When a person says, "I hate you because of the color of your skin." Right. That's that is personal bigotry. Bigotry. Yes. So it's actually like not. The textbook definition of Jim Crow racism. Yeah. But moving on. And yet, despite more than four years of such <laughs> unbridled bigotry, Zhang was not marginalized. Rather, she scored a plum job on the editorial page of one of the planet's most liberal and influential news organizations. Have they read the title? <laughs> like, at all? Ever? <sighs> Because people talk about the times like, you know, it like went sour in like the 2000s. Yeah. No. Like try reading it in 1924. Been, it hasn't come back. Yeah. No. But I will say no, that no. those, the, the run up to the, to the Iraq war was the point at which I decided I could never trust anything the Times published. You right. know, it not just be, that they were. Be trash. That the they, recipes are good. The, <laughs> they always lie about browning onions though. Oh yeah. Yeah. They but, always on. lie. God damn it. Oh, anyway, anyway, uh, John got her job offer even despite her obnoxious comments about several of her new male colleagues. <gasps> David Brooks is an absolute nitwit too. She called, called David, David Brooks, Brooks a nitwit. nitwit. <laughs> well, have you read his column? Just oh asking. <laughs> no, yeah, Let's yeah. not forget this lightly veiled death wish. A just God would not allow Tom Friedman to keep talking. <laughs> Charles Bronson in Death Wish, Wish 5. <laughs> Friedman's going down. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, get, carry on. All right. All right. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to come to the end of this, but... Um, it just it, keeps going. It just well, keeps it, going. It seems like this bottom well of faux outrage. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, it, then they go, they start talking about Roseanne Barr, blah, blah, blah. Oh. ABC canceled or hit serious. What an injustice, right? Yeah. There yeah. are two. Okay, here's the conclusion. There are two morals to this story. First, the left run relies on double standards the way cars run on gasoline. Okay. Second, racism is now totally cool with American liberals as long as the bigotry is anti-white. Well, no, I... I think it's true that racism is totally cool with American liberals. I think that's actually a fact. However, they, you know, if you define, I was just arguing with one of my relatives on Facebook, and you know how oh I, God. I know how I just like say all the time, I'm just not going to be on Facebook. I'll, I'll, I'll show up, I'll post some pictures of my kids, and then I'll just ghost it for I'll another week. Go, yeah. Right? That's right. it. That's all I want to do because I get in these pointless arguments. Yeah. And so I made a comment, and of course, immediately I'm, on a po I'm in a pointless argument. Right. It's about how, yeah, I've seen Confederate, uh, one of my f friends saw a Confederate flag in a truck in Eatonville, Washington. He's like, I thought we were done with this here in Eatonville. Like, like come on, if dude, like, if dude. liberal Ann Arbor, Michigan, I can see Confederate flags. So, uh, just saying. You know, I, I don't know why you would think, you know, rural Eatonville Eatonville's would be... Immune somehow. Immune. Anyway. It's, uh, no, it's, it's deeply absurd. I, don't, I got nothing for it. Yeah. And so, like... Okay, I, I, now I've got to ask. So, what was, the, what was the meat of the argument here? Oh, I said liberals are fine with racism and well, white supremacism. It's like, well, not in my experience. All liberals I know are deeply offended by these things. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to out my... 
my relative, relative. and get right, into sure, this. Right, sure, sure. But I was saying, well, it's unless you mean something different. I say, well, I probably do mean something different than what yeah. you're talking about. You should listen to our podcast. <laughs> listen to our podcast. We'll explain because, it in detail. You know, Excruciating three-hour detail. Yeah, if you literally define um, racism as just yelling the N-word at people, then no, of course not. Oh, Liberals no. would never do that. Never do anything like that. But, uh, you know, how about, you know, well, just because the, you know, it's not racist. Everyone would have to pay a million dollars to buy a house in this neighborhood, whatever their skin, skin color. color. That's not racist. racist. How could that be racist? racist? That's what I mean. Or my favorite about how the recent candidate for uh, the Democratic nominee for governor um, had an unfortunate name. An unfortunate name. Or how, you know, like people in a red state may not... Right, like so we him. have to we have to pre-screen our candidates because yeah. we know better. We know that he would never win in in red states. Well, and and honestly, we really want to find candidates that bigots will like. So <laughs> that's going to be important to us, like having someone who's electable, like that kind of thing. <laughs> because yeah. that makes a lot of sense, right? Right. Rather than talking about someone's platform or someone's right. Right. Anything, yeah, qualifications, I, 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 et cetera. Uh, but we last week our show was the the campaign speech of El Sayad, and I think we mentioned that. Oh yeah, we, there was a legitimate concern that people wouldn't vote for El Sayad because they thought they didn't really distinguish him from the other brown guy in the race. Oh yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> that small detail. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that very well could. Have and I would been expect, part of what part of what you know caused him to lose. Well, and I think it's also um, perpetually naive of me to think that Democrats would do differently. So we're most of the way through these articles, I have to say. <laughs> but wait, there's more. There's more. Our next figure, yeah. our next uh, media controversy mm-hmm. involving online, right? Online hoo ha. This is uh, Russell Myers. Okay. Uh, from uh, Medium. Okay. The title of this article is Alex Jones, Hero of the Left? Hmm. And so this encapsulates, uh, encapsulates, enca- encapsulates, bleh, 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 capillary action. No, no. Disen, disen, encapsulate. Disen sorry, I just had a stroke. I smell <laughs> toast. <laughs> encapsulates. Encapsulates a lot of what I've been hearing on Twitter because of this situation with uh, Alex Jones. Yeah, uh, Infowars and how he's getting thrown off of Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blah blah. blah. And some some liberals are aghast, shocked. right? Shocked. But a lot of leftists are saying, you know, I'm fine with this, and here's Wait. why you should be too. Wait, leftists or liberals? Leftists are fine with it. Liberals are aghast. Okay, tell me. And more. We're, yeah. we'll we'll get we'll get into that. Okay. Many people are reading this, are too young, have forgotten, or merely paid no attention to the actual court case of the People versus Larry Flint. Right. Let me recap. Larry Flint was a vile person. Well, yes, he was a pornographer. Yeah, yeah. Any pornographer is, but carry on. I used to read Hustler, by the way. Yet in the early 70s, the government tried shutting down his publication for public indecency. It was an attempt at censorship. Mm-hmm. Now, my favorite was the um, the Falwell lawsuit. Right. Oh, yeah. Which was a, a, a real victory for the whole concept of satire. Yes. Right? But anyway, uh, what most who even followed the case did not realize was that pornography was not what the case was truly about. This was an earlier case. This wasn't the fall wealth situation. Right. Larry Flint was an openly and was openly, openly and vocally against the Vietnam War. Yes. During that case, he published full-color, unedited images of victims in Vietnam. In Hustler, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At the time, they were the most horrific images I had ever seen. They gave me nightmares, and I recall some of them to this day. Yeah. While I will not give Jones quite as much credit, his silencing on popular platforms mirrors much of the Larry Flint case. I personally consider him to be a nut job. But he challenges the narrative. Mm. It's more than curious that he, with tens of millions of followers, gets removed from multiple platforms all on the same day, almost immediately after starting a petition for 
to Trump for the purpose of pardoning Julian Assange. Yes. This attempt to remove Jones from the public view will backfire epically. It already has. Before Monday, how many on the left had given him a single thought in Martyred months? Martyred him. Martyred him, yeah. Yep. Even if you did, it was because of some limited article. There. Some Something, right. Or he was about a lot of jokes with like his topless oh, yeah. pictures about his nutritional supplement ads and stuff like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Now he's been handed the chance to file a court challenge against those who removed his pages. That court case has the potential and likelihood to reach the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. What a world. What a world. Oh, Which means that we will see a lot of Alex Jones for years. years to come. <laughs> Even Ching. worse. He's become a martyr. Yeah. Not just for the far right, but for the far left. That's what I mean. Like, okay, carry on. Mm-hmm. Hero the socialists in this battle. I wrote yesterday how terms of service agreements can be interpreted and changed by the corporation at any time in any way they choose. I won't repeat that whole argument. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to skip ahead here. Go ahead. The far right seems infringement of their rights is coming from the government. The far left sees it as corporate control. Right. I see it as both. Yeah. Carry on. So so it will be the ultimate irony if Alex Jones, the figure, not the person, becomes the one who winds up uniting all of us in some ways. Some the man way. who supports oppression of many parts of our society may pave the way for people standing together and fighting for our freedom in very real terms. Yes. Many centrists who support his censorship say it is not the government who took action against him. It was corporations. They like right. to say... They like to say private private corporations, but these companies are actually publicly held, right? Yeah, yeah. They're not held in a way that makes them accountable to the public. Correct. In addition, there are laws in place which limit the amount of data the government can collect. There is no limit as to how much money they can buy or require corporations to report to them. The NSA, FBI, and CIA work directly hand-in-hand with corporations. We've seen this regarding mass surveillance and information leaked by Snowden. Right. Wait, so so it's liberals who are fine with it and leftists who are upset? Yes. Okay, that's what I was trying to clarify yes. earlier. Got it. But Sorry. it's weird because a lot of the people on Twitter that I follow that are, I think of as quite leftists mm-hmm. are not as left as me in this matter. Right. And that they're like, they're fine with it on the, the grounds that no one gives a shit. <laughs> you know? Well, and, and also they're t- they're taking a small piece of the no platforming frame. Right. They are. Right. And we're going to talk about more about the no platforming thing. So yeah. I'm not going to read too much of this. For one thing, this article is kind of incoherent, but oh, yeah. I apologize for that. But um, we've already watched as the government waged war. Oh, here, now this piece here. There are laws. This is why I wanted to read it. There are laws which state the government cannot censor news or information. There are no laws stating they cannot instruct corporations to take direct action in their stead. Correct. Not long ago, that's exactly what Congress did. They told Facebook, Google, Twitter, and all social media to take steps to censor anyone who contradicts the government narrative. If you are remotely awake, you watched this happen. Yes. That's why we have most of the journalists who I enjoy reading on RT now. Right. They're on Russia Today now. And you yeah. can't find them. You can't find them. You can't read them. You can't access what they have to say. They keep vanishing. You keep getting unsubscribed. Their followers keep sort of disappearing and being wow. disappeared. You know, That's so weird. All your subscriptions go away. Because the government told a corporation to do that, We've al- which is yeah. legal. <clears throat> yeah, We've already watched as the government waged war on whistleblowers. Manning, Assange, WikiLeaks, demonetized progressive and conservative sources. They call RT Russian propaganda, even though RT has Larry King... Lee Camp, he, like he's a radical. Right? I know, come on, man. Lee Camp, Chris Hedges, Jesse Ventura. His show is hilarious, by the way. Right. <laughs> because he's Of course so, it is. Well, he has a lot of great guests, but he's so clueless yeah, that it's funny. Yeah, it's hilarious. And no, previously I love Jesse. had Carry on. Abby Martin and Tom Hartman for years. Yeah. In the time since Jones was censored, other names have been silenced. Peter Van Buren, mm-hmm. Daniel McAdams both mm-hmm. from the Ron Paul Institute, Scott Horton of antiwar.com. Mm-hmm. Um, you've probably heard about Black Agenda Report. Oh, They're yeah. They're always getting... Always getting hammered. Yeah. All, uh, all advocates for pardoning Assange, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech. So now so now all you're left with of all these nut jobs <clears throat> on the 
uh, I don't know where they, I don't know where they call themselves, but they're liberals. Yeah, and they're all going Assange. He's just such an evil man. Yesterday, one article I, I tried it. sharing by Caitlin Cost Johnstone. Him with the election. One article I tried sharing by Caitlin Johnston was marked as against the terms of service on Facebook. Yes, mm. if you try and share some of these some of these hard left actual left sources mm-hmm. you will quickly find that they don't get shared they, don't they, get, they shared. get censored no they one get sees banned. them they get blocked they get deleted they disappear they disappear without explanation yeah it's very 1984 actually several posts and articles of my own were marked as spam by the system and i spent nearly an hour confirming my account getting articles and posts restored on most days i probably would have not have had time but i expect more attacks to come yeah so. And that's what, and that's what Jones symbolizes, and you know people are all like, it's not a First Amendment thing, and you know, it's not, it's not a First Amendment thing. Yep. Because the government didn't say you can't speak here in public. However, we have this little problem where the only public space for conversation is now privately, corporately owned. Yeah, so I was hoping you would talk for a while on... We had a conversation in the car. <laughs> making, yeah, great. Making faces. I've been talking a lot and reading a lot, right? Sure, but, yeah. yeah. Um, we had a conversation in the car where we were talking about this uh, notion of what free speech meant. Right. And th- that this led us to talking about the, the broken commons. Oh, okay. So I, I'll try, because my... my um, my thing is the thing I've had for a long time is how the 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 never Trumpers mm-hmm. and the centrist Democrats who are kind of merging into one thing. The resistance. The resistance. Yes. Um are really starting to scare me. Yeah. Yeah, they're just they're just I mean, and I've referred to them for a very long time as crypto fascists. Mm-hmm. Not even proto, they're straight up fascists, but they're crypto fascists. Mm-hmm. Yes. In that you can't they have a smiley face on it. Yeah, they have a smiley face on it. They're like rainbows and unicorns, you know. Yes. And um, it feels good because they're attacking people you don't like. Yes. Yeah. And then they also like will, I mean, for example, they cannot like require all disabled people to be sterilized mm-hmm. because that would be wrong. And we've settled it to the Nuremberg trials, right? Yes. However, they can persuade parents that maybe your disabled child ought to be sterilized for their own good. Or that it's just good sense to, uh, good to sense. abort a, a, a disabled child. child. That just makes know, sense. Before, before this child They is can born. do that soft sort of persuasion, right. and no one looks then and says, God damn fascist, what the hell are you saying? Right. Because, right. you know, it kind of sort of makes sense in some way. You're right? just trying to make things easier on the child. Just trying to make things easier on the child, on the family, <laughs> on society. You know, we're just trying to make things easier, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, so, and so women can live better lives. Preventing you know. suffering. Preventing suffering. Know. I mean, so the crypto fascists are straight up fascists, mm-hmm. but they have a lot of, I mean, thick layers of window dressing. The, the so abortion they have, and eugenics argument is not one that I typically think a lot about, having come more from the liberal side. You right, know. right. But you coming more from the Catholic conservative side. Like, that's all it I definitely, see. It's, definitely, it's, it's present. It's present, right? But I, I see it as, as coming from de- definitely the free speech angle. Oh, well, then there's, there's lots of different angles, right? Yes. So this sort of crypto-fascism has all these layers to, like, of plausible deniability. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm not saying we should sterilize disabled people. No, no, no. Right. What kind right. of a person would say that? Right. I'm just saying right. that parents have a right to make medical choices for right. their children. Right. That's all I'm saying. Right. And maybe their parents wouldn't choose to do this. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm just putting it out there. And then if you want to say... Well, I don't know. I don't feel good about that. That seems a little weird to me. Like, so what are you? You don't believe in parent choice? What are you? You're some kind of like hypocrite? Right. What are you? Right. Et cetera. You're, you're going to f- force a 12-year-old girl to have a rapist baby? Baby? Is that what you're here for? Yeah. What yeah. kind of a monster are you? And so on, right? Same thing with free speech. So you think you should give Alex Jones a platform? Right. You wanna, you're want you defending Alex Jones? Actually, I'm not defending right. Alex Jones. 
I I want to say Alex Jones is a real piece of shit. He has made oh, yeah, the lives of a lot of people quite miserable. Living he has, hell. Do, his his followers have doxed people. He's pr- pushed this narrative that um, the mass shootings in Sandy oh, Hook were staged. Were staged. Yeah. They were crisis actors. They didn't happen. No one was shot, and they have forced the parents of murdered children. To go into hiding. To go into hiding, to have to move repeatedly. Yeah, yeah it was just, it's, he's and not it, a good person. And this stuff has real consequences, like the with the uh, Pizzagate thing, with people, crazy like, people show, show up. up with guns. He's promoting stochastic terrorism. Yes. And yeah. we've the, gone over that we've idea over that. before. We've gone over that. But real people will show up with real guns and point them at people. Because of what Because of his, his free speech. You right. Know? And so, I think there's a legitimate free speech argument where he's shouting fire in a crowded theater. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that actually the government yeah. does have the means to act yeah. within free speech p- parameters right. for what he's doing. And sim- and also, I would also argue, the United States needs um, stricter libel and... Uh, libel laws. Libel would, laws and slander laws. Yeah. Um, but, so do, we can actually... Would yeah, do would actually something. Do, right, would it would do, do something, something for, for this kind of thing. I'm not sure if we want exactly the UK model, but I think it's we could We can consider. move closer. Yeah. yeah. Can, so... This isn't about defending Alex Jones or anything he's done. No, This is about who has the power to censor public conversation. Yeah. And um, the crypto fascists love this. Yeah. Suddenly, they're all about no platforming. Right. Suddenly, when we're talking about... um, who are these assholes? What are they? What are they even their names? Ben Shapiro? Look, who was the other guy? Oh, the, the, no! The underground, the dark web, the you dark know, the intellectual web. dark web, according the intellectual to Barry dark, Weiss, yeah. right? Supposedly, the intellectual yeah. dark web, or yeah. uh, any of these sort of alt right folks want to speak on a college campus. Yeah, the crypto fascists want to have like a a thoughtful discussion about well, should we restrict their free speech here? Right. I mean, you know, right. I'm just asking. Yeah. And now suddenly they love this yeah. when they want to empower corporations to close off any avenues for public debate, debate right. about what's actually happening. Right. So that, and that's my that's my WTF in all of this. Right. So is seriously. That, suddenly is, now you're all about no platforming. Is that all of these debates about you know are taking place in corporate controlled for profit spaces? Yes. Right, and there no longer exists any public space for this conversation. I mean, you could come on our show, but who's going to hear you? They're not, all my all our other freak we're friends. We're privately right? owned, right? But I well, mean, right. there's no uh, there's no commons, there and no that's commons. really an important point for me. Is no, there's not a place protected by a law and tradition where you can put up your soapbox and put talk. up your soapbox and talk. And anyone who wants to listen can come hear you. Yeah, and when well, and that's also I have to be clear. Uh, we haven't talked too much more about Antifa, but that frame where there was a public commons where you could put up your soapbox yeah. is the frame that the anti-fascists sort of like emerged in. Where yeah. you would go and disrupt them and say, okay, now I'm pulling right. your soapbox out. Sure. Out. You, uh, because, you, you, yeah. could, you could get a group and, and um, drown someone out. Yeah. Or in extreme cases, you could knock down the soapbox, you know, yeah, knock yeah. down and, the person. And mind you, now the government can't do that. Right. And shouldn't do that. Right. And I would never support the government doing that or a corporation paying right. a guy to show up and stop right. you from talking. But in the, in the world where all these spaces are corporate. Right. The most controversial things are mm-hmm. always the, 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 you know, the bleeding lead, right? It bleeds, right. it leads. It's, it, that's how... You know, it's all about uh, sticky eyeballs. It's all about, you know, attracting an audience and ad revenue. Right. And so everything has to be hysterical. I mentioned early on that, you know, we never get follow-up, right? Like right. what happened to the guy that, that killed Heather there's, Heyer? There's no right? money in follow-up. There's no money in follow-up. And th- this is kind of like why you and I aren't wealthy here <laughs> is we're we, like, um, like the computer scientist um, – Donald Newth, I see it as our job to get to the bottom of things, not stay on top, top of, of things. things. Right. Right. But there's not money in that. There's no money in that. There's actually no eyeballs in that. There's maybe insight and there's maybe learning and maybe. understanding, we hope. Oh, but yeah. but there's no ad revenue. No, no, who wants yeah, who wants ads for that? And so these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, everything, everything becomes biased and slanted towards the sensational and the controversial. Right. And never the thoughtful. And it's corporate owned, it's private property, they can shut you down like blinking an eye. If you start to embarrass the owners. Start to embarrass the owners. Right. Or the government. Right. 
they, it, you know, it's they can shut you down. Right. And mind you, they have so much. They have so much influence over what people see <clears throat> and what they think based on what they saw. Mm-hmm. They don't have to get heavy handed very often. No. Most of the folks no. who are like enthralled to the crypto fascists yes. will come to shut you down if you try to have this thoughtful conversation. Right. right. They'll come to shut you down. Well, you know, it's what Snope says. <laughs> Oh, hey, that sounds like me. <laughs> Let's just read Snopes on the issue. Yeah. And, you know, like if you want to talk about something that may be controversial, then it's like, well, that's just, you know, anti-science. So yes. there. Yes. And, you know, that's the end of the conversation. So really to me, the the the, the end run around this, the fix, mm-hmm. is restoring something resembling digital commons. And oh, yeah. what that means exactly, I think that it's a big topic, but like, you know, why don't we nationalize Facebook? Right? For example. <laughs> why don't we make, you know, Mastodon a public utility? Well, that's right? the thing. If if Facebook is nationalized, then it is the government shutting down your free speech. Then it is the government. It's an interesting explicitly, yeah. explicitly, and we have laws against that in our constitution. And mind you, that does not... <laughs> that actually putting those laws into place and yeah. making it a public square yeah. does not vitiate the First Amendment's ability to no. shut down dangerous speech. No, it doesn't. No. Because we actually have a we we have a a, a juridical understanding of shutting down dangerous speech. Right. And right. the frame is you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. That's not a free speech issue. Right. That's a safety issue. Yeah. And similarly, you can't encourage people to show up with guns at somebody's house yeah you just you can't do that that's not a matter of free speech that, that's a matter of public safety all right well so, yeah we're, we're not going to solve this particular issue today but i've been following it and it's been percolating in my yeah, head percolating, and yeah. all, all these little controversies sort of point towards big systemic problems they really do well and like you said yeah it's just when you see liberals cheer for this when you see the, the resistance cheer for this. Yeah. This is crypto fascism. Yeah. And, and the, it should frighten you. And the, I don't see people who are hard left full throatedly saying, no, Jones needs needs and deserves to be on this platform or whatever. Uh, no. And because they don't feel that way. No, no. Le- leftists don't think that he needs and deserves to be on Facebook. Right. They don't feel that way. I mean, and, as leftists, I strongly feel that there's. There's a case to be made yeah. to get him the hell out of here that isn't a matter of just censoring him. And so there's the yeah, there's the safety security argument there's and and it, to be in solidarity with like the fa- the um Sandy Hook families. Yeah. You can't also be defending to the death his right to speak his mind, right? You know. And At so, their expense. Yeah. And this is where we get into like what bounds these limits of of left and right and and corporate speech and sure. And part of it is the desire to to be anti-fascist, right? And so I would like you <laughs> now to read. Oh yes, well, this is uh, we have had this book for quite some time, like almost a year, I think. Uh, uh, I don't yeah. remember when we got it, but we but were yeah, going to read it on time. the podcast. It got buried in the crib under a pile of blankets and stuff, and Shh. other books. And um, why do we have a crib? But carry on. No, the we this was in the crib for our baby to read. Oh yeah, as a bedtime story. But she hasn't finished it. And, I know. I mean, it's got some She's, teeth marks, but that's true. She <clears throat> she likes a good book, you know. Yeah, Mark Bray Antifa, and that I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Ant, Antifa, not ant. Antifa, Antifa, because it's taken from Italian, um, right. means anti-fascist. Antifa, the anti-fascist handbook. And we I was reading the, you this book, parts of it last night as a bedtime yeah. story. <laughs> and it it didn't have the effect, I hope, which was sort of a help you get to sleep. No, In I, fact, I you were bouncing like, off the walls. <laughs> I know, I was bouncing off the walls. I, I, I like had terrible like dreams of being in pers- you know, pursued. Pursued, yeah. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Maybe not the best thing to read right before it's trying to sleep. Yeah, yeah, d- don't... Yeah, you're not bedtime fan. But this is a great book, honestly. It really is. And it really is. I'm impressed. It's it's fairly dense, but it's not dense in the academic sense of some of the other... It's dense in that there's information in every sentence. There's a lot of information, but it's, it, it is targeted towards a, a slightly 
more um, a, a larger audience who aren't necessarily quite into the academic jargon. Yes. Right. And I appreciate correct. that about it a lot. So mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you to read two passages. All right. One is um, from the introduction. It's called, what is anti-fascism? And of okay. course, it starts by what is fascism? And right. then, How can you not? then there's another part for from chapter five, which is entitled "So Much for the Tolerant Left: No Platform and Free Speech." Yeah. And this skips over most of the book, and we read some more of it. You know. But yeah, yeah. But it's two particularly relevant parts. I'm handing Grace the book now. Excellent. So and start start at the first marker and go to the like. Where am I stopping? You're stopping when you get to the second marker. Oh, okay. When I get to, oh here, okay. There's like a three dot. It's like a break in the text there. No. On this page here. On that. Oh, I see it. Got it. Okay. On that page, it's a fairly long passage. It's a long passage. It's not the whole chapter. But we're gonna go with it. What is anti-fascism? Before analyzing anti-fascism, we must first briefly examine fascism. More than perhaps any other mode of politics, fascism is notoriously difficult to pin down. The challenge of defining fascism stems from the fact that it began as a charismatic movement, united by an experience of faith, in direct opposition to rationality and the standard constraints of ideological precision. Mussolini explained that his movement did not feel tied to any particular doctrinal form, end quote. Quote, our myth is the nation, he asserted. Quote, to this myth, to this grandeur, we subordinate all the rest, end quote. As historian Robert Paxton argued, fascists, quote, reject any universal value other than the success of chosen peoples in a Darwinian struggle for primacy, end quote. Even the party platforms that fascists put forward between the world wars were usually twisted or jettisoned entirely when the exigencies of the pursuit of power made those interwar fascists uneasy bedfellows with traditional conservatives. Mm-hmm. Quote, left fascist rhetoric about defending the working class against the capitalist elite was often among the first of their values to be discarded. Post-war, after World War II, fascists have experimented with an even more dizzying array of positions by freely pilfering from Maoism, anarchism, Trotskyism, and other left-wing ideologies and cloaking themselves Mm. in, quote, respectable electoral guises on the model of France's Front National and other parties. I want to, I want to comment that people often, this is another uh, sort of a side topic, but people on the right often claim that fascism is fundamentally left and that you know, the Nazis were leftists. They were socialists because, you know, it's right there in the name, right? Right, like, you know. Yeah, but actual leftists, as in supporting labor and the working people, that yeah. element of the National Socialist Party was actually purged early on. Those people were killed. Right, they killed, <laughs> the, yeah. Like the union organizers. The, yeah, like, they killed them. Yeah. That side of the of the, the, the left side of, of the National Socialists. Yeah, they ate that and, like, discarded it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and this also gets at kind of what I'm talking about when I I described it as crypto fascism. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. I agree with Angelo Tosca's argument that quote to understand fascism, we must rewrite we must write its history. End quote. Yet since that history will not be written here, a definition will have to suffice. Mm-hmm. I, th- pa- I thought this is a pretty good definition. I thought right. Paxton defines fascism as a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation, or victimhood, and by the compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity, in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants, working in uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites, abandons democratic liberties and pursues with redemptive violence and without ethical or legal constraints, goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. So That's a pretty good one. It's a good definition, and you know what it puts me in mind of? What's that? So after Donald Trump's inaugural speech, mm-hmm. um, George W. Bush actually was heard to comment, that was some weird stuff. 
Right. <laughs> right. Because the rhetoric in that speech was so full of extreme imagery. Yeah. Um, he talked about American carnage. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't that that the actual text of that inaugural speech doesn't make sense unless you consider it as a fascist manifesto. Right. It, it, in, yeah. Literally in those terms. And that's what always gets to me, folks. Like, he's just talking in a word salad. I'm like, no, he's no, not. No, he's not. That's not a word salad. I mean, yeah, he does have malaprops. And, well, you and, know. Uh, but no, it's really yeah. adjust your lens. It's unfocused. But he, that's he, not he does, a word salad. He does screw up phrases and misspell oh, yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But yes, mostly it, right, adjust your lens. He's not talking to you. He's not, yeah, he's not talking to you. And those, it's just like when, when um, Reagan talked about states' rights in his uh, campaign Greens. speeches, right? He it, wasn't talking to you. Like, why was he so obsessed with states' rights? rights? What could that mean? It meant something specific to a large a audience. audience. Right. Yeah. Specific, yeah. It's a specific call out to a specific <clears throat> audience. Right. And uh, not like a, not exactly a call to action, but a call to, to the voting booth. It, yeah. It was uh, uh, like a... Sol- uh, an announcement of solidarity with those people's agendas. Right. Now, when compared to the challenges of defining fascism, getting a handle on anti-fascism may seem like an easy task at first glance. After all, literally, it is simply opposition to fascism. Some historians have used this literal minimalist definition to describe as, quote, anti-fascist, a wide variety of historical actors, including liberals, conservatives, and others who combated fascist regimes prior to 1945. Yet the reduction of the term to a mere negation obscures an understanding of anti-fascism as a method of politics, a locus of individual and group group self-identification, and a transnational movement that adapted pre-existing socialist, anarchist, and communist currents to a sudden need to react to the fascist menace. Mm Mm-hmm. This political interpretation transcends the flattening dynamics of reducing anti-fascism to the simple negation of fascism by highlighting the strategic, cultural, and ideological foundation from which socialists of all stripes have fought back. Yet even within the left, debates have raged between many socialist and communist parties, anti-racist NGOs, and others who have advocated a legalistic pursuit Mm-hmm. of anti-racist mm-hmm. or anti-fascist legislation. This is all still going on. This is all like still at the heart of this like debate over what to do with on these platforms. Oh, right, right. right. You know, it's all, so we're living it. This, we're is, living why it. this is so this relevant. It's all happening right now. Yeah. Um, and those who have defended a confrontational, direct action strategy of disrupting fascist organizing. These two perspectives have not always been mutually exclusive. And some anti-fascists have turned to the latter option after the failure failure of the former. But in general, this strategic debate has divided leftist interpretations of Mm anti-fascism. This book explores the origins and evolution of a broad anti-fascist current that exists at the intersection of pan-socialist politics and direct action strategy. This tendency is often called radical anti-fascism in France, autonomous anti-fascism in Germany, and militant anti-fascism in the United States, the UK, and Italy. Among today's Antifa, the shorthand for anti-fascist in many languages, at the heart of the anti-fascist outlook is a rejection of the classical liberal phrase incorrectly ascribed to Voltaire that, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death mm-hmm, you're right to say it. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, yeah. uh, you know, it's an explicit rejection of that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. After Auschwitz and Treblinka... I mean, there are limits of, to free speech. Yeah, yeah, right. After Auschwitz and Treblinka, anti-fascists committed themselves to fighting to the death, the ability of organized Nazis to say anything. Mm-hmm. Thus, anti-fascism is an illiberal politics of social revolution, applied to fighting the far right. Literally illiberal, as in, you know, we don't allow this ingredient in our salad. You know? No, you yeah. can't be here. Yeah. Nope, no cyanide, thanks. Um... Or a melting pot, I guess you might say. Well, no, no. Well, actually, I've always felt salad was better than melting pot. Yeah, okay. Many of us don't care to assimilate. Yes. Thus, anti-fascism is an illiberal politics of social revolution applied to fighting the far right, not only literal fascists. As we will see, 
anti-fascist have accomplished this goal in, in a wide variety of ways, from singing over fascist speeches, to occupying the sites of fascist meetings before they could set up, to sowing discord in their groups via infiltration, to breaking any veil of anonymity, to physically disrupt... Infiltration is my particular favorite. Yeah. The anonymity thing is, is interesting because that's another controversial activity of the left now. It's a dox... It's the dox people. So, dox fascists. Um, and you see this uh, specifically in the work of Sean King, right? Yes. Whose whole thing on, on social media this now... This man is a fascist. Is to, you need to know. Is to share videos of people like doing their their... Doing their racist number. Doing their racist number, you know, fighting, attacking people, whatever. And demand that the community track them down, track, them, and, track this person down, hold and them get them fired, and get well, and, and share their name. And, well, when it's a crime specifically, yeah. it's like find this person so we can press charges. Right, right. And because in, the cops won't do it. Yeah, and just yesterday, there's a cop that beat up a guy in in Philly, I think. Jesus. Yeah, and he's sharing this, and I guess the guy is uh, discharged, and they're considering charges. So. Right. Um, and so, and it's kind of that, like that strategy. The strategy is controversial between and, liberals and leftists. Right? Apparently, and yeah. I, I get the doxing people, like doxing the Sandy Hook parents, right? Yeah. And anyone can use yeah. this framing right. to their own end. Sure. And anyone can say, well, he was a fascist, so. Yeah. Um. But I think if we are it's, engaging, it's a dangerous game. It's a dangerous yeah. game. And I think if we're engaging with intellectual honesty. Yeah. You know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. You're not confused. Right. And when I say, you know, punch a notch today, have a good day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not saying punch anybody you don't like. Yeah. You understand I, that. And you're not, uh, you're, I've heard you talk about um, your sort of unwillingness to really advocate that we're going to um, get racists fired. You know, yeah, yeah. Because because taking away someone's job, in other words, it wasn't actually directly related to their their public fascism. Right. I mean, probably <laughs> yeah. a cop. I think that's yeah, all that yeah, matters, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. But um, but like I don't know, an accountant somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, accountant who was was blatantly showed racist up in, in his public. khakis and white polo to you know yeah, or, to or, be an yeah. asshole somewhere. It's it's controversial. I recognize that it's controversial. So, I'm know, not fully con- so, you know, comfortable with it. Are we really gonna say we're gonna make sure this guy can't eat? And can't that's how's his family or, or himself, and more and than radicalize, <laughs> radicalize, ra- radicalize him further. Yeah, right. Is that really the best strategy? I think yeah. that's a good open question. Yeah. Uh, and so, doesn't mean we shouldn't. But doesn't mean doesn't necessarily it should mean to be it, considered. But we should be talking about this. Yeah. And as a and as a Catholic, mm-hmm. knowing that we live in a capitalist society, yeah, and that your job is how you eat, right, right. Am I really? Th- Am I really prepared to threaten to take away someone's food and housing? Right. Um, is that really how it's, I feel about this? It's so. So you know, the, the, I, and I think we ourselves layer. are not putting on black ski masks and getting in lo- and kneecapping fascists. Yeah, I, I haven't done that today. Right. Um, or any other day, just to be clear. <laughs> um, but also, I think as a strategy. Hmm. There's sort of a moral question, but I think there's a legitimate strategy question: mm-hmm. is do we want to send this guy to the only other people that will employ him? Yeah, yeah. And strengthen their relationships the <laughs> and strengthen. I mean, do we really want this guy to be a cop right, now, right. or or to or, or to whatever, wh- whatever right, or right. whatever it is, to work on somebody's super PAC, right? Um, right. to be an accountant for them or, and strengthen or that become community. Become the new intern for the Alex Jones show, right? Or literally, what was happening. On the alt right was you know, like become a special assistant to um, Steve Bannon. To Steve Bannon, you know, or, and then you know, right, or, or get a get a job at Breitbart, you know, to be because this does wind up strengthening some people's voices because they get right. pulled out and signaled out. For they don't special, work at IBM anymore, right, or wherever the hell they work. They're sort of anti-radicalized, if you will. Right. The, yeah. So, I think there's a very legitimate strategy question about. Do we want to take widespread action that strengthens the fascist community and get connect and further connects them to each other mm-hmm. and embeds them mm-hmm. with each other? Is that really a good idea? Yeah, yeah. I'm not convinced that energize, it is. energize, energize to them. energize them. Yeah. I, I'm not convinced that it is from a strategy st- standpoint. Yeah. Okay. That said, 
Um, uh, Sowing discord, uh, infiltration, anonymity, physically disrupting their newspaper sales, demonstrations, and other activities. Militant anti-fascists disagree with the pursuit of state bans against extremist politics because of their revolutionary anti-state politics and because such bans are more often used against the left than the right. Yes. Here's it, where it gets interesting. This is where it gets interesting. It's, it's why I'm not a fan of hate speech legislation. Mm-hmm. It's why I'm not a fan of, say, like Facebook taking Alex Jones right. down. Right. It, it's, I'm not going to stand there and, and support that and cheer right. for that. Yeah, honestly, for every Alex Jones that comes down, there's a dozen Caitlyn Johnstons or, or, They're going or down. left. You know, People actually who are literally anti-war, pro-peace, you know, like and that may be the whole message, right. right? The whole message is anti-fascist, anti-war, or pro actual, peace, or even pacifists. Or pacifists, you know. like pacifists are being, you know, <laughs> you know, censored and, right. and no platformed, or even just being like, you know, I really don't like what the DNC and D Triple C are up to. Yeah, it's it's en- enough. It's you know, enough, or right? Or supporting Assange, or supporting Snowden, or supporting any of that, yeah. or, or supporting like the the journalists that. Talk right. about this. Right. Puts like a, you know, puts you in the crosshairs, <laughs> as they say. Right. So that's why I don't think the state needs to do this kind of no platforming. Mm-hmm. The state can't do this kind of no platforming. This has to they be a community. They certainly can't do it wisely. No. Well, no. It has to be a community decision that that is not welcome here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because. Distributism. <laughs> ding. Yes. Uh, it's it's you know so it's why I'm not a communist. It's why I'm not a socialist. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't want the state making these decisions. I want the community to make them. Mm-hmm. Um, now some Antifa groups are more Marxist, while others are more anarchist or more anti-authoritarian. Mm-hmm. In the United States, most have been anarchist or anti-authoritarian since the emergence of modern Antifa under the name Anti-Racist Action. ARA, yeah. In, yeah, ARA in the late '80s. To some extent, the predominance of one faction over the other can be discerned in a group's flag logo. Whether the red flag is in front of the black, or vice versa, or whether both flags are black. In other cases, one of the two flags can be substituted with the flag of a national liberation movement, or a black fa- flag can be paired with a purple flag to represent feminist antifa, mm-hmm. or pink flag for queer antifa, etc. Yeah, so the, the the ones you often see is a, a black and red flag. Right, together. And it's... It's an anarchist antifa, right? Right. Well, if it's black flag in front, that's those are anarchists. Right. Black is anarchist, red is communist. Yeah. Um, despite such differences, the antifa I interviewed agreed that such ideological differences are usually subsumed in a more general strategic agreement on how to combat the common enemy. Yeah, I hang out with a lot of communists. <laughs> I, I really, I don't know. We're, I'm not going to derail us too hard, but um, we. Uh, I can't d- just define what kind of leftist I am. I-, I have sympathies with different groups and different ideologies, but to try and say, oh, I'm exactly this, I'm just not, I haven't figured oh, it out. I like some libertarians, you know. Yeah, I haven't figured it out. So I, got a lot of libertarian so I don't tricks. have a label, yeah. you know. I, no labels. <laughs> not them, for God's sake. That's a different thing. <laughs> different thing altogether. But no, I know that, I know where I'm not. I'm not really, a, uh, I'm not really a, a democratic socialist. Yeah. Whether I organize with them or caucus with them is another story, you right, know, right. all that, uh, you know, and I'm in solidarity with them, but um, they're too far. They're too far to the right. To, for, for my, right. To, for me to feel like I really live there and belong there. Right. And, you know, these are particulars good for conversation. Yeah. But when it comes down to, I think this is a, a little piece that's lost in last year's Charlottesville. Yeah, there like, there are a lot of lefts and a lot of socialisms. There's a lot of left and a lot of socialisms. But last year at Charlottesville, they were marching on public housing. Yes. To attack black people in their homes. I was yeah, I was meaning to look up some more about that too because that's another. You know, we remember Heather Heyer, but then everything else just gets blurred and lost in the noise over time. Right. So but yeah, they were <laughs> and, and the there there's I sh, to Wikipedia's credit, they talk about this quite a bit. They talk mm-hmm. about how how the um like follow on was just how badly the fol- the police actually failed to protect people right right how badly the police failed to protect and serve yes the public and, that pays their salaries yeah. and that's part of it is they you know drove them off campus and they went marching towards a, a low income housing project yeah <laughs> and so yeah um 
Antifa was like, hey, not here. Yeah. And so I, I, I defy you to find anybody else that was going to stand up and say, hey, right. not here. The police weren't down for Police it. weren't down for that. No. So uh, uh, <clears throat> whatever issues I have with socialists and communists aside, yeah. if we're going to show up and stop people from you know literally attacking people in their homes, right. that's my team. And we're part of Antifa if we right. do that. For, yeah, yeah. If you do that, if you're there for that, you're part of Antifa. Right. Okay. And um, the exact flag you fly, not that important immaterial um a range of tendencies exist within that broader strategic consensus however some antifa focus on destroying fascist organizing others focus on building popular community power and inoculating society to fascism through promoting their leftist political vision that i think is where i'm where would like to live right many formations fall somewhere in the middle of this spectrum in germany in the 1990s a debate emerged in the autonomous anti-fascist movement over whether Antifa was mainly a form of self-defense necessitated by attacks from the far right or holistic politics, often called revolutionary anti-fascism, that could form the foundation of the broader revolutionary struggle. I don't think it is or could be. Mm-hmm. I think it's primarily a, strateg- a, a strategy. It's just, it is uh, my understanding, and I haven't finished the book, but it is literally a strategy. A know, strategy of self-defense. Uh, uh, among many. Mm-hmm. The, and it it's like uh, there's a saying of um what's his name uh, of king crimson the band mm-hmm. um used to say because king crimson would disband and reform with a new lineup every few years right and um oh god i wish i could remember this feels so the, the, stupid anyway right uh he would say well whenever whenever music whenever there is music that only king crimson can play king crimson will appear to play it will be and that's that's how I think of Antifa. It's like when there's a need, you know, they they actually the cells and organizers often lie, kind of low in a community, and yeah. when fascists are organizing, hey, hey, it's look. time. Yes, it's it is, almost like yeah. It yeah. is. They're literally an immune system. It's you immune know, system response. The right. leukocytes of of the body politic, right? Right. That show up. Yeah. When something very dangerous. Yeah. It's affecting the body. When the, you know, it's like your your most basic <laughs> your sort of low level immune response when no when the authorities aren't doing, aren't anything, doing anything, when the doctors aren't healing yeah. you. Right. Uh, and so so in that respect, I don't think it can be an organizing ideology. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not an ideology. Right. And it can't and it can't yeah. be uh, you know uh, is it a I reaction think, can't be right. a platform. No. Uh, I think anti fascists do need an ideology. They need ideologies. Oh, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, and I think but that's, that's not what structures their, but, their work. At all. Okay. Um, depending on local context and politics, Antifa can variously be described as a kind of ideology, an identity, a tendency or milieu, or an activity of self-defense. Mm-hmm. Despite the various shades of interpretation, Antifa should not be understood as a single-issue movement. Instead, it is simply one of a number of manifestations of revolutionary socialist politics broadly construed. Mm -hmm. Most of the anti-fascists I interviewed also spend a great deal of their time on other forms of politics, labor organizing, squatting, environmental activism, anti-war mobilization, or migrant solidarity work. In fact, the vast majority would rather devote their time to these productive activities than have to risk their safety and well-being to confront dangerous neo-Nazis and white supremacists. Right. Antifa act out of a collective self-defense. The success or failure of militant anti-fascism often depends on whether it can mobilize broader society to confront fascists, as occurred so famously with London's 1936 Battle of Cable Street, or tap into wider societal opposition to fascism to ostracize emerging groups and leaders. At the core of this complex process of opinion-making is the construction of societal taboos against racism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression that constitute the bedrocks of fascism. These taboos are maintained through a dynamic that I call everyday anti-fascism. See chapter six. <laughs> okay, we'll have to talk about chapter six in the future, but Finally, not today. Finally, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that anti-fascism has always been just one facet of a larger struggle against white supremacy and authoritarianism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This his, is pretty critical, I think. Yeah. In his legendary 1950 essay, Discourse on Colonialism, 
The Mart- yeah. uh, Martinican writer and theorist Ame Cazare argued conventionally, convincingly that Hitlerism was aberrant to Europeans because of its humiliation of the white man and the fact that Hitler applied to Europe colonialist procedures which until then had been reserved exclusively for the Arabs of Algeria, the, quote, coolies of India, and the, quote, niggers of Africa. This is a, an amazing statement to me. I just kind of stopped and looked at you like, whoa. Like, whoa. <laughs> like, and? <laughs> um, so basically it's what I was saying about folks with um, 45's election, like, mm. oh, you're afraid it's going to happen to you now. Yeah, it's about the humiliation. Right, right. Yeah. Like, oh, no, like, you mean us? <laughs> and some writers have, have called that out right. among Trump supporters and said this is really, they feel emasculated, humiliated, and so this is, that's what leads to fascist organizing. Right, right. Um, and actually, oh, Antifa but, is not about the ideology. Fascism isn't strictly about the ideology either because it keeps recurring with a in different, different face, circumstances. Different circumstances. Different flexible, right, you right. Know, different, well, let me just read that one more time. Different enemies. Yeah, read it one more time. Legendary 1950 essay, Discourse on Colonialism. The Martinican writer and theorist, Amé Césaire, argued convincingly that, quote, Hitlerism was aberrant to Europeans because of its humiliation of the white man and the fact that Hitler applied to Europe colonialist procedures, which until then had been reserved exclusively for the Arabs of Algeria, the, quote, coolies of in- India, and the, quote, niggers of Africa. Without in any way diminishing the horror of the Holocaust, to a certain extent, we can understand Nazism as European colonialism and imperialism brought home. Mm-hmm. And that's what I mean when mm-hmm. I'm talking about, like, the shock and horror <clears throat> Right. Of 45's election. Right. Like suddenly it's like, oh, like you're going to do this to us now? We're at home. Yeah. Right. The decimation of indigenous and populations. Then, then we have, you know, now the quote, the quote um, resistance. resistance. Right. You know. Please. Without any diminishing, oh, well, uh, the decimation of the indigenous populations of the Americas and Australia, the tens of millions who died of famine in India under British rule. The 10 million killed by Belgian King Leopold's Congo Free State and the horrors of transatlantic slavery are but a sliver of the mass, death, and societal decimation wrought by European powers prior to the rise of Hitler. Early concentration camps, known as, quote, reservations, were set up by the American government to imprison indigenous populations, by the Spanish monarchy to contain Cuban revolutionaries in the 1890s, and by the British during the Boer War at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. Well before the Holocaust, the German government had committed genocide against the Herero and Nama people of southwest Africa through the use of concentration camps and other methods between 1904 and 1907. For this reason, it is vital to understand anti-fascism as a solitary component of a larger legacy of resistance to white supremacy in all its forms. Mm -hmm. My focus on militant anti-fascism is in no way intended to minimize the importance of other forms of anti-racist organizing that identify with anti-imperialism, black nationalism, and other traditions, rather than imposing an anti-fascist framework on groups and movements that conceive of themselves differently even if they are battling the same enemies using similar methods. I focus largely on groups that self-consciously situate themselves within the anti-fascist tradition. That's what Antifa is. That's what Antifa is. So that's a, that's a segment. It's a quick segment. Do you want me to read? Um, I, I, I'm okay. I can continue. You're okay? You sure? Yeah. yeah. Give me uh, one second here. Sure. Go ahead and start. Okay. Chapter 5. So much for the tolerant left, no platform in free speech. The, quote, sacred tradition of free speech was under attack. The birthplace of the free speech movement of the 1960s, the campus of the University of California at Berkeley, was paradoxically said to be spawning a no free speech movement half a century later. The embattled Berkeley College Republicans were under siege, as first Milo Yiannopoulos and then Ann Coulter were prohibited from expressing their opinions by effing babies, as Bill Maher described them, who were carrying out what he called the liberals' version of book burning. Yeah, I'm not a fan of Bill Maher. Yeah, you go fuck yourself. <clears throat> probably, probably doing that right now. <laughs> a horrifying alliance of masked hoodlums who arrived from off-campus 
petulant students and weak-kneed administrators, petulant. as various pundits described them, had turned universities into propaganda training grounds for the next generation of brown shirts. <laughs> Well, there's that. <laughs> like, oh, well, sort of, but not sort in the of. sense that... <laughs> not in the sense you mean. Right. In another clear Nazi reference, a CNN commentator warned, if you don't stand up for Coulter's liberty today, someone will come for yours tomorrow. Coulter's liberty? Give me a break. And more importantly, the Enlightenment will die a violent and pathetic death. And Chris is like, really? really? <laughs> is this all it takes? The clashes of early 2017 brought the, quote, masked, self-styled anarchist bent on wreaking havoc, known as Antifa, into the public spotlight. Despite a complete lack of historical or the theoretical knowledge, pundits concluded that anti-fascism is a greater threat to free speech than even fascism itself. Because it's not like the fascist would shut down your right to free speech. No one, <laughs> would, what kind of person would do that? Right. Uh, and this is not, He's not exaggerating. He's not, no, this no. is what was happening. <laughs> this was actually happening. Yes. There were these these conversations were taking place. Yeah. Uh, literally aren't they aren't you aren't they the real Nazis? Aren't they the real Nazis? No. <laughs> no. Actually they're not. But are anti fascists enemies of free speech? This chapter is a guide to answering this and other controversial questions pertaining to free speech and anti fascism in the era of Donald Trump. Ultimately, I argue that although the ideology of anti-authoritarian, anti-fascist promotes free speech far more than that of their critics, even their liberal critics, militant anti-fascism refuses to engage in terms of debate that developed out of the precepts of classical liberalism yep. that undergird both liberal, quote, and, quote, conservative positions in the United States. Instead of privileging allegedly, quote, neutral universal rights, Anti-fascists prioritize the political project of destroying fascism and protecting the vulnerable regardless of whether their actions are considered violations of the free speech of the fascists or not. Yep. So, yeah. So, in other words, basically, it's, it's, you know, the, the, their concern about the sensitivities of the fascists and their free speech rights is just not their highest priority. It's not my highest priority, sorry. Right. Peter... Here to punch fascists and chew gum, all and, out of and gum. protect uh, to protect the vulnerable. Protect the vulnerable. That's, yeah, that's the point here. That's the point. And also, like and, if your free speech protections aren't punching, right. are punching down. Right, right. It's not. And, you know. and the um and the the people making this argument about well, aren't the anti-fascists the real, real fascists, fascists here? They are in general again not really engaging in good faith. No, because they don't. They're not confused. They're not confused. They themselves are crypto fascists many times. Absolutely. How free is quote free speech? In terms of the debate often the terms of the debate often presume that anti fascism is the only threat to an otherwise pristine state of free speech <laughs> safeguarded by the American government. Yeah. About that. Well, you know, actually ask, we've been talking about ask that. Ask the Move 9 about that. Jesus yeah. Christ. Right. It is imperative, however, to understand that the American government already seriously limits what can be expressed and who can express it. Rightly or wrongly, the government has placed a number of constraints on speech. It restricts false advertisement, libel, and television, television commercials for tobacco. Mm -hmm. It prosecutes incitement to violence, <laughs> protects copyrights, and limits when and where pornographic images can be shown. This, again, yeah, well, you we mentioned already, libel right. earlier, right? And incitement to violence. Right. We already Crowded theater. prosecute incitement to violence. Yes. If Alex Jones is inciting people to violence, we have law that governs that. Right. We're we not, don't need new laws and new action and new censorship right. to respond. But, you know, the same thing where, like, it's taken over a year to get this actual fascist convicted right yeah. and a lot more are still waiting court dates and all right. that um, and then walk free as that happens yeah you can't like people can't the vulnerable can't wait can't so around waiting <laughs> right. for the for the wheels yeah. of justice Jones is getting sued right yeah I it's mean, happening he, right now he's, they're, oh. and his lawyers assert no reasonable person could believe anything he says <laughs> he's <laughs> But but he's still here because this, that shit takes years takes to years work to out. Work out, and it, okay. And the government also limits when and where pornographic images can be shown. So do I. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whenever I see it, I turn it around. I burn it. I take it yeah. out. Of public view. Um, yeah, she's uh, covering up the Cosmo. We're talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> 
especially in times of crisis, Americans actually sympathize with restrictions of speech. This was evident in the aftermath of September 11th, when half the country favored press restraint on covering the Abu Ghraib torture. Mm -hmm. Or in the fact that the journalists are often arrested or harassed by police at protests, such as Occupy Wall Street and No Dapple. There's a great article that I've been meaning to to talk about. You know, I want to do three shows a week, right? I know, right? It, but about, remember, after the inauguration, yeah. there, or during the inauguration, mm-hmm. th- there was a large group of people arrested. Yeah. And one of the journalists who was arrested talks about his, like, multi-year legal nightmare, where he was just covering this event i'm just here right journalism but what's actually happened to him has been this nightmare and it's like and he was up for felonies that would put him in jail for what was 18 years years. or something curiously the resistance is not concerned about these assaults yeah yeah. right and my and and again also my quote conservative friends who are, are supposedly libertarian well, you know, he shouldn't have been around people who were, like, overturning trash cans. Just saying. <laughs> He's a journalist covering people overturning trash cans. Where else should he be? You know, so they literally had no concern at all about the fact that he may have been wrongly arrested or charged or this was an overreach or... Or, or, or any of these or, things. Or just... Or what I believe, which is just, you know, designed to have a chilling effect. A chilling right? effect. Literally. Absolutely. Um, or that uh, Trump's White House restricts access to oppositional... Reporters. Mm-hmm. This is why the United States only ranked 43 yeah. on the World Press Freedom Rankings in 2017. Now, this book came out, like, was written over a year ago and came out, like, almost a year ago. Yeah. Um, and things have just gotten weirder and worse, like where he's literally referring to the press as the enemy of the people. Yeah, yeah. on and on, right? Yeah. And, and, like, the resistance rightly is like, <gasps> Yeah, well, stopped clocks and all that. Yeah. Readers will draw their own conclusions about the wisdom of these various restrictions. But regardless, they show that free speak absolutism, (coughs) like many kinds of rights absolutism, is impossible in a society of overlapping interests. This is why we have to have Chris on. I'm going to email Chris and see if we can have him on next week. Okay. I want to have it out with him because, he, you know, as much as I don't like the Enlightenment, I do like human rights. (laughs) Funny that. Funny that. Yeah. But Chris has often challenged me about human rights and its framework and the the really the fi- uh, philosophical underpinnings. Mm-hmm. I, you know, so next week may be the week where he convinces me, but we'll see. Okay. Such conflicts of interest have materialized most clearly in the American state's suppression of the free speech of left-wing social movements mm-hmm. when they have grown strong enough to pose a threat. Yep. Recently, for example, Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter protests have been brutally suppressed. Yep. Historically, hundreds of foreign-born radicals were deported and anti-war agitators were imprisoned and assaulted by police during the Red Scare of 1917 to 1921. Later, McCarthyism blacklisted communists and other radicals. In the 1960s and 70s, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI used illegal covert methods to violently shut down social movements in what was known as COINTELPRO, Mm -hmm. counterintelligence program. The corpses of murdered Black Panthers show how the government takes only a somewhat neutral stance towards free speech when it does not feel endangered itself. Moreover, if we take free speech not merely in terms of its legal status as enshrined in the First Amendment, but as a broader human value, we must recognize the complete rightlessness of the Guantanamo detainees, Mm -hmm. that de jure restrictions on the free speech of the country's millions of prisoners and the restricted voting rights of many formerly incarcerated. All this, and not to mention the de facto restrictions on the speech of the country's millions of undocumented immigrants, most of whom are too fearful of deportation to express themselves, and the degree to which colossal disasters like the wars in Vietnam and Iraq have infringed upon the right to free speech and all the other rights of those who were killed. American alliances with dictators and support for military coups in Chile, yeah, you don't Argentina. Get, you don't get any free speech when you're dead. No, that's one of these things. It's really weird. Um, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Guatemala, Honduras, Haiti, Greece, Indonesia, Zaire, and elsewhere also demonstrate how promoting the value of free speech is really 
far down in the government's list of priorities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it took a lot of speech away. A lot of speech. The First Amendment is intended to protect non-incarcerated citizens from the government then, but not from the private sector. Right. This is where it also gets, you know, we talked last week about how complicated and fraught it was to have like a, a corporation hosting up a, a public, political candidate, political uh, candidate for, to for the public, a, a rally to the public, Jeez. while partially funded by a by the uh, state. By the state, it's just it's just a fraught mess, honestly. Uh, ridiculous mess. Um, but not from the private sector. Free speech rights, such as the right to protest, are seriously curtailed curtailed in privately owned quote public spaces like shopping malls or Jakarta Park during Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Likewise. This gets at also what I was talking about, uh, we were talking about the lack of comments. Lack of, a, lack of a comments to have a public protest. Likewise, homeowners associations that manage condominiums have far more leeway to restrict the speech of their residents than the government. Corporate employers, yeah, like yeah. government officials, are often subject to non-disclosure clauses right. in their contracts. There's another book we haven't We've talked about oh private we government. Finish and we need to talk about it called private government right. about this topic um, that prohibit them from sharing privileged information, even when it is clearly in the public interest. In the information era, the power of tech companies to control the range and content of speech has been enhanced, as the historian Timothy Garden Ash points out. What Facebook does has a wider impact than anything France does, and Google mm -hmm. than Germany. Billions of users. Billions. I think about three billion or more. Yeah, larger than any country. That's yes. that should chill you. Uh, Just give chill you, you pause to the bone. At yeah. the very least. Yet the impact of tech companies on speech is really just the latest manifestation of the larger relationship between rights to speech mm -hmm. and the underlying economic system. Poor people have never been able to talk freely. Right. That's like right. not. That's not new. Yeah. Free speech is often likened to a marketplace of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to quote him later. <laughs> Embedded in that metaphor is the American liberal notion that the key to combating, quote, extremism is to trust in the allegedly meritocratic essence of the public sphere. If all mm -hmm. are allowed their say, then the good ideas <laughs> will float to the top <laughs> while the bad sink to the bottom, like live yeah, action Reddit. Yeah. Which yeah. is a cesspool. You know what floats in a cesspool? <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Extremism, quote, extremism, a seemingly innocuous term that centrists used to conflate Nazis with anarchists, right. jihadists with communists, arises when this, quote, natural process of discursive exchange is impeded. Mm -hmm. The conclusion is that the one who disrupt, disrupts a fascist speaker brings us closer to fascism. Right. Right. Then the right. aggrieved orator who is actually advocating for fascism. Yeah, gibberish. This marketplace metaphor was popularized in the United States in the early 20th century by the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who argued that truth could best be promoted by a free trade in ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's what the devil thinks. <laughs> Legal scholar C. Edwin Baker noted that, quote, the marketplace of ideas theory consistently dominates the Supreme Court's discussions of freedom of speech. In fact, the, quote, marketplace metaphor perfectly describes the power dynamics of free speech in a capitalist society. Yep. Though not in the way that its proponents <laughs> right, intended. Right, right. <laughs> Multinational corporations aspiring towards mono monopolistic control of capital and information establish the general confines in which the vast majority of humanity yep. sell their labor and articulate their speech. And this is, yeah, again, it's tied up with the with the private government thing. And then it's also tied up with... Um, the commons thing. The commons thing, the bounds of, of, have, of everyone having to be an employee. Right. Right. And so if you want to hold at, that job... At will, you know... Just think about what you're saying in public. Yeah. Um... Sorry. Uh, can't pull information. Sell their, sell their labor and articulate their speech. The market of commodities is inseparable from the market of ideas. Oh, oh the, the, yeah, the, the fact that it's tied up with capitalism and these, these commercial sites, Facebook, these are, these are commercial concerns. These are money-making enterprises. They're right. public, publicly traded companies, right? Right. 
that inherently slants their you know, the whole notion of, the speech, notion of speech inside right. this platform. Um, the market of commodities is inseparable from the market of ideas. Since ideas are commodified along with everything else in a capitalist society. It gets even weirder because, you know, in these sites that are free, like Twitter mm -hmm. and Facebook, you start to realize, well, what's the commodity? And you realize your personal <laughs> information, me. you, your identity, and all your, you know. That's you, what they're selling. Is access to you. Is That's what sold. they're selling. Right. That's the commodity. Here's Grace and everything she thinks. Come look. It gets, you can have it for $5. And then you can market to her. What do you think, bro? This is the marketplace of ideas. ideas. Ding. All non-incarcerated citizens may have an equal right to literally speak, but the ability to make that speech heard and make it matter is highly stratified. Yeah. So every, every time I sign on Twitter, I found that more that I've been un, I've unfollowed more people right more leftist accounts but right. not not personally no I didn't do it it was yeah. done it was done this just seems to happen and I, I've like started taking screenshots of my like following list because yeah. it's because it's, it's that it's, weird it's that weird and ever, it's that all, Orwellian like everyone on the left is is re reporting this that like, if you nope. share certain articles and certain tweets and whatnot you they you're disappear. basically you wind up, the algorithm, you know, let's just say you wind up not showing up on very many people's timelines anymore. Yeah, strange that. Support for campaign finance reform in opposition to the Citizens United ruling by the Supreme Court show how many American liberals agree about the conflicts between free speech and big money. Certainly, the counter-argument is that, quote, free does not necessarily mean equal in either the market of ideas or of commodities. But this is where the question of meritocracy comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. The market concept is lauded for its ability to promote beneficial outcomes. When applied to the question of fascism, we must ask, can we trust that the quote marketplace of ideas will not elevate fascism to the forefront of the public sphere? No, we cannot. No, we cannot. We already, I mean... We've run this experiment. In, in the, the, the capitalist scheme, we're told that the people who do the best are the most virtuous. The, the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos of the world have what they have because they're so brilliant and they work and so hard. And the record hard. shows that that's a lie. Right. So it's, the, it's analogous, right? Right. It doesn't, it's not the, the they're not the, the best people. Yeah. You know? Such trust sustains the perspective Perspective of liberals who agree with John Milton when he argued that society should, quote, let truth and falsehood grapple. <clears throat> Whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. Quote, end quote. Unfortunately, though, truth did not fare so well in interwar Europe. <laughs> in fact, the horrors of the era were so catastrophic that for many they definitively crushed the very modernist assumption of the steady upward progress of truth that undergirded Milton's optimistic assumptions. In fact, historically, fascist and fascistic ideas have thrived in open debate. Sometimes public discourse has been sufficient to squash fascism, but sometimes it hasn't been, which is why anti-fascists refuse to pin their hopes for the freedom and security of humanity on processes of public discourse they have already shown themselves to be fallible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's the uh, first part of chapter five. Yeah. So so much for the tolerant left. <laughs> anyway, I've never claimed to be tolerant exactly. Not exactly. Yeah. I love this book. I think it's impressive. It's very um, impressive. It's very it's very well argued. Yeah. I mean, so if you want to like submit to the marketplace of ideas, there we go. But yet, you know, is everyone carrying it? I don't think so. Alas, no. We're going to hand out copies. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just about done here. Yeah. I have one more thing. It's been a long show, and I okay. knew it was going to be a long show. I showed you the pile of articles and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. But um, our, our ardent listeners are here for the long haul. They're here for us. They're, they're up for it. I have, I have a lot of confidence in them. Yes. I have one more thing to read, and then I'm going to close the show by editing in the audio from, uh, from our friend... 
Wait. Our, our friend gave us audio? Not literally. Oh. Karl Popper. Got it. From the 1945 book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And you mentioned this earlier. I was planning to bring it in, bring in the conclusion. Circle. Less well known is the paradox of tolerance. Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. Hmm. If we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed, and tolerance with them. Yep. In this formulation, I do not imply, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant philosophies, as long as we can counter them by rational argument and keep them in check by public opinion, suppression would certainly be unwise. But we should claim the right to suppress them, if necessary, even by force. Mm -hmm. For it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on the level of rational argument. Does that sound familiar? It certainly does. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, all these, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos, all these folks, they don't have arguments. No. Right. I wish they did, actually. I wish they did. I wish it was interesting, but there's too much at stake. Right. Yeah. Our, our safety, the safety of people that we love and care about. But begin, they're not prepared to meet us on the level of rational argument, but begin by denouncing all argument. They may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it is deceptive and teach them to answer arguments by the use of their fists or pistols. In the case of Peterson, they obscure their argument with mysticism. He obscures mm -hmm. his arguments with mysticism. Yeah. That's an old strategy. It's yeah. not new. There were uh, The Third Reich used religious arguments. Oh, yeah. And weird ones. But religious not And religious. obfuscated ones. Right. right. We should therefore claim, in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant. We should claim that any movement preaching intolerance places itself outside the law, and we should consider incitement to intolerance and persecution as criminal, in the same way as we should consider incitement to murder or to kidnapping or to the revival of the slave trade as criminal. Right. I'm going to insert here uh, a clip um, by comedian Amer Rahman. Oh, yeah. And you've heard it before. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So uh, I, I can't, I don't, I don't actually have a way to play it while we're here listening with our headphones on, yeah. but, but you'll hear it. You'll hear it. It's good. Uh, and it all started, you know, it all started with that stupid Richard Spencer article like near the end of last year right it was like oh look look at this dapper nazi who doesn't dress the way we thought he would here's an in-depth interview where he gets to hear all of his fucked up ideas in a mainstream media outlet which then led to more interviews with other nazis in mainstream media outlets mm -hmm. and then richard spencer got punched in the face right which was an amazing moment <laughs> in comedy history right? because i don't know if you know Richard Spencer was being interviewed, and in the interview, he was asked about his Pepe the Frog badge. So he was trying to explain a meme, and then out of nowhere, a hero came along and punched him in the face, instantly turning him into a meme. It's like casting a spell. And then every white liberal came out of the woodworks going, mm, I don't know, I don't know, if that's what we should be doing. Should we really be applauding someone for punching a Nazi? Is that how we want to have political conversation? Shouldn't we hear people out? If you punch a Nazi, it doesn't make you as bad as one. You know what we should do with Nazis? We should debate them, and we should defeat them in the marketplace of ideas. I don't really know where that is. Uh, I would like to defeat Nazis on planet Earth first. And then after we eradicate them here, you can fight them in the marketplace of ideas. Fucking Narnia, Mordor. Whatever. Whatever imaginary realm it is that you think Nazis can be constructively debated, go for it, right? People get very upset. Oh. 
Oh, do you support political violence? Do you want me to support political? Oh, just slow down, okay? Do I support political violence? <laughs> We're talking about punching fascists in the face, not suicide bombing, okay? Relax. Do I, why do I support political violence? Why the fuck are you a volunteer Nazi safety advocate is my question. <laughs> That's a funny thing to be concerned about, the well-being of hypothetical Nazis. Well, it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. Who gets to decide? Who gets to decide who gets punched in the face? If you punch a Nazi, who's next? Hopefully more Nazis. Why would you, why would you only punch one? That doesn't seem right. Okay. I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. Till next time. And though we spoke quietly, and though we spoke quietly, and though we spoke quietly, Eyes and ears of history, 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 caught hey, every I gesture, into caught every gesture, hey, caught I every gesture, I and every gesture.